Good morning. Uh, we're here now to open uh, the second day of the conference, and uh, we are opening with uh, an exceptional guest, uh, Mario Monti, uh, first professor of economics at Bocconi, actually my professor of economics at Bocconi, uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, European commissioner, and then Italian prime minister. So uh, there is uh, hardly anybody better than him to start the second day. Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luigi. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, last year at this conference, I was asked uh, why the EU enforcement of competition tends to be, in general, since uh, 15 or 20 years, more vigorous than the one elsewhere, particularly in the US. I uh, provided some answers, uh, which are partly institutional, Competition is uh, alongside with the more recent area of money and monetary policy and central banking, the one of the two really federal uh, uh, aspects that we have in the life of the EU. Then uh, the uh, decisions of the competition authority within the Commission um, stand. They have immediate legal effect. Of course, the parties can appeal against those decisions to the court, but until the moment when eventually, and if it is the case, the uh, decisions are annulled, they uh, stand. They have affected the economic and legal landscape. Also, very importantly, relatively, for example, relative, for example, to the US, one cannot speak of political cycles in uh, the handling of competition enforcement uh, uh, at the EU uh, level, even the relationship with the uh, electoral processes and even the European elections that will happen in 10 days or so are uh, much more uh, indirect. Um, and so uh, these are some of the reasons and yesterday, throughout the conversation in the day here, I did uh, perceive uh, an attitude vis-a-vis -vis the EU, uh, which is profoundly different from the one which I knew when I started my job as competition commissioner in Brussels, namely, okay, we discuss and then up there, remotely, there is the European Union, from which uh, we may expect uh, some incisive role, if not some guidance role. And uh, I did notice, in particular in the discussion about uh, um, competition and the digital platforms, this uh, sort of uh, demurgical uh, slash fatalistic expectation, because there is the EU out there. Uh, but I also said last year that, uh, uh, yes, we have to expect uh, the will of the European Commission to take on a more and more incisive role in uh, the whole things pertaining regulation, including competition enforcement, uh, but that when it comes to digital platforms, of course, uh, we have to take into consideration non-technical aspects which are of huge importance, like uh, uh, most digital platforms uh, uh, tend to be US-based, and uh, so the, there may be a, a deep risk of perception in case of uh, a set of negative decisions by the European Commission in that area, and we have seen a number already, uh, a, a perception that there is something protectionist or of industrial policy or anti-American and so on and so forth, which has to be factored in ahead of the whole decision-making process. Particularly, I think I said, if one or two jurisdictions uh, um, are leaning towards uh, declared or uh, subliminal uh, nationalism. Now, after one year, what can we say to this uh, effect? And I will say uh, these things also because, Luigi, I believe that uh, in your fantastic project, I'm really impressed by the progress made in, uh, in one year, uh, 
unless, unless I am not well informed, there isn't really so far a portion dealing with the, the, the political economy and transnational aspects of enforcement, which I think would have to be taken on board uh, sooner rather than later. If we want, if you want, uh, uh, eventually the recommendations to have a high degree of feasibility in this concrete world. Now, since uh, last year, I think we can say that, uh, yes, the EU has shown uh, once again a determination to go ahead in uh, becoming the standard for regulation. I will only mention the GDPR. Uh, and in the area of digital platforms, the Commission is better equipped now than it was uh, uh, last year this time. Uh, why? Well, there is a human factor. We have seen uh, a continued determination of Commissioner Vestager to this effect. Uh, but also, there is now the analytical, um, highly coherent, it seems to me, framework uh, in the uh, report by Jacques Cremer and his uh, uh, colleagues, uh, which is, uh, of course, does not commit at all uh, the, the commissioner, but is a very interesting, I thought, uh, blueprint. And one aspect which did occur since last year, actually a couple of months ago, I would like to particularly bring to your attention, because one key aspect uh, in order to assess the criticisms uh, veiled or explicit about a protectionist pro-European anti-US attitude is, is the European Commission in the area of competition subject to economic and or political pressures by uh, EU actors by the member states, by the uh, industrial and financial groups in Europe. Well, the case which is very telling from this point of view is a merger case, not concerning digital platforms, but uh, a very classical industry. Well, one railroads <laughs> on which uh, in the US uh, antitrust uh, had the opportunity to become adult, as was mentioned yesterday. The Siemens-Alstom merger was uh, submitted, was notified to Brussels. Um, uh, of course, uh, Siemens, the large uh, uh, German-based uh, multinational by now, Alstom, uh, equally French-based. Uh, uh, and uh, never was uh, a merger case uh, coming from Europe uh, blessed uh, with uh, such a high charisma of political will by both countries, Germany and France, which, as you might know, are not the most uh, irrelevant among all the equals which compose the uh, EU, uh, nor the least uh, vocal. Well, the, um, uh, the merger was deliberately engineered, one should use this <laughs> word in this case, to set up a European champion, which has been for a long time a, a top priority of industrial policy, but also of identity policy of Germany and France. Uh, the pressures were huge. Uh, the merger was prohibited. The merger was prohibited by whom? By Commissioner Vestager. Is Commissioner Vestager in a retiring mood right now? Not exactly. She is candidate to become president of the European Commission. Um, from whom will depend whether she succeeds or not in this rather natural ambition on the governments of member states. First and foremost, uh, the German and the French government. Uh, both of them, particularly the French, as is in their style and in their um, recently shaped up uh, Colbertian ideology, uh, have been particularly tough on her. Uh, and they even have threatened uh, to uh, reconsider altogether the merger regulation, etc. For those of you who are perhaps uh, equally interested in mergers as they are in digital platforms, relax, 
Uh, I hate uh, unanimity because it blocks uh, so frequently the progress of the EU, but in some cases unanimity is so nice. <laughs> now, in order to change uh, uh, the merger regulation, except in one aspect, which is the definition of the threshold for notifications to Brussels, which can go through with qualified majority of member states, but for any more substantial modification, you need unanimity. Good luck. <laughs> um, and so that is not very likely to occur, even though it is now, if you look at the uh, French government uh, uh, position paper in view of the next week's European elections, that is number one priority, to allow European champions. By the way, uh, uh, I uh, entered this debate, uh, being of course uh, miles away from the Commission or any responsibility, uh, I noted uh, that uh, should, uh, I think it's perfectly legitimate for Europe and European states to want to, pers to pursue uh, European champions. Of course, what will become of them depends very much on uh, the merits on which they are born and on whether or not uh, their um, deliverance uh, comes with uh, huge deviations from the regulatory setup. And I said in the debate, suppose that Commissioner Vestager had uh, 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 been deferent uh, to the will to set up this European champion. Okay, then the merger would have been approved after a huge debate in the press uh, because it was not so obvious that it should have been approved. Now, if it is a European champion, it will uh, have the vocation to operate uh, with uh, super, uh, super high-speed uh, trains and uh, equipment throughout the world. So it might have uh, to require the merger approval by uh, the Washington authorities, the uh, Beijing authority, the Tokyo authorities, etc. Can we reasonably expect those other players to be not just neutral in assessing the case, but deferent to the strong will of Europe to have a European champion? I don't believe we could have this expectation. So what would be the ultimate consequence? Uh, we, we just have to see in, in our common experience when G. Honeywell, already approved by the Justice Department in 2001, came to Brussels and uh, for a number of objective reasons which were upheld by the European Court of Justice, we denied authorization. Well, that merger was never consummated, not even in the US, because uh, the economics of the merger, much to the regret of the legendary Jack Welch, uh, would, n would not have been there if they were prohibited to sell their aircraft engines and avionic equipments in the European market. So there are some self-correcting mechanisms uh, in uh, the working of uh, um, antitrust uh, uh, laws which, uh, which prevent huge uh, uh, deviations from good practice. But now, uh, so uh, I, I point to this siemens alstom case because uh, for it the Commission and the Commissioner have been sharply criticised in the EU, but I think it's uh, a, a strong point to show elsewhere as proof of uh, independence. So this reduces the probability that a priori a, a decision from Brussels which is tough on other players, on non-European players, can be said to be, of course, biased in favor of uh, Europe or European governments. Now, uh, so all the prerequisites are there to have in the EU the little modest guiding star for enforcement of uh, digital platforms in the future. Well, I think some objective reasons are there, but 
please, let's not forget the populistic and nationalistic component here. Um, how do I perceive, I may be totally wrong, the impact of rising populism on uh, the ability to enforce competition vigorously? Here I see a, a paradox. If I were a digital platform, um, probably US-based, uh, a, an ever-increasing degree of populism in the US would scare me a bit from the point of view of increasing the likelihood of more vigorous uh, regulation, but also antitrust enforcement. Does the same thing hold true for Europe? More populism in Europe, as we are seeing largely these days, and nationalism. Would that equally bring to a more aggressive uh, attitude? I, I'm, I'm not so sure, because the nationalism you have in the US, which uh, goes hand in hand with populism, is uh, an, an America first type of nationalism. In Europe, it's not really a Europe first type of nationalism. It's a perhaps uh, France first or Flanders uh, first. So the scale is different. The ambition is the same, uh, but the scale is different. This means that uh, my own main concern as to the future of the EU as a whole, as well as in particular for the strength of competition policy in the EU, is that uh, the more we were to see uh, nationalism jumping ahead, uh, paradoxically, uh, the, not so paradoxically after all, the, 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 the bigger the threat to the acceptance over time of a powerful uh, non-political competition enforcement out of uh, Brussels. So we, we have to take this very, very uh, uh, seriously. At any rate, uh, these are the likely consequences of more populism and nationalism on the likelihood of vigorous competition enforcement. But then there is the feedback effect. Suppose that irrespective of what happens uh, uh, to European nationalists uh, and, and, uh, and populists, uh, the Commission continues in its uh, uh, determined uh, pace and becomes more and more a reference point in enforcing the digital platforms. Well, what would be the reaction in the US if that becomes serious? And I'm not pronouncing in favor or against uh, ex ante uh, on, uh, on uh, structural remedies and the, and the breaking up of companies. Uh, just to make sure that was a, a legal, open and explicit possibility when we reviewed the, um, the well, in Regulation 1, 2003, setting up the so-called modernization of competition policy in Europe, we explicitly provided as a remedy of last resort for the um, power of the Commission to break up. So. Uh, Imagining that, uh, I don't know, in five years, six years, seven years, the, the community uh, uh, emanating from the Stigler Center and uh, the residual rest of the antitrust uh, uh, thought community around the world came to the conclusion that in some cases structural breakups are the way to go. Well, uh, I wish good luck to the Commissioner in Brussels uh, applying such a structural remedy uh, to a US-based large digital uh, platforms. Uh, the reactions will be uh, not insignificant, I believe. And so I think this uh, uh, brings upon all of us who are interested under various angles uh, in these issues to 
to prepare the ground intellectually and politically for whatever landscape there might be in the future. Uh, maybe it's very presumptuous to make a proposal in relation to the great work which is going here, uh, going on here by the Committee for the Study of Digital Platforms, but why would you not uh, consider in the context of this study a set of reflections on uh, approximating the actual uh, uh, political economic landscape for uh, whatever uh, proposal you may come forward with, uh, what would be the points of difficulty in the international political scenario, how to address them. For example, would it make sense to try and work out uh, I don't believe that the competition authorities themselves, which have a great degree of cooperation, could uh, do that in the first place. Maybe a place like here could uh, uh, work intellectually on, uh, a, uh, on an informal understanding of uh, uh, some principles guiding antitrust enforcement for digital platforms. I'm not referring, because that you are doing it already, on which should be the actions taken, but uh, uh, how the climate around those potential actions, if you are compelling intellectually and your line one day is followed, how that uh, uh, can go through without uh, uh, destroying what is left of uh, a, uh, a, a, a good faith uh, um, transatlantic cooperation and, and, and how could uh, one day China be embraced in, uh, in this. Uh, and my, my very last note is that uh, I would find uh, such, a, uh, such an example forward-looking reflections, reflection particularly interesting because I must say, when I listened yesterday to the idea of the, uh, how was it, uh, digital authority or digital agency, great, great. Uh, but we all know that in this world uh, um, there is regulatory capture. Um, my own experience in Europe even within the European Commission is that the broader the remit of a commissioner and for the competition commissioner that is 360 degrees unlike for the transport, the energy, the agriculture commissioner, uh, the broader the remit and the more removed you are physically and politically from the place where the decision has its impact here subsidiarity works in the reverse. Subsidiarity tells us it is uh, appropriate to make uh, decisions at the closest, uh, at the, the nearest possible level to the play. But of course, in terms of lobbying and of capturing, uh, uh, for example, in Europe, it's, it's much easier not to be captured if you sit in Brussels than if you sit in a national capital. Uh, and so uh, from the point of view of uh, not being uh, uh, captured, uh, can I say the, the digital agency seems to me, from, only from this point of view, the, the least promising avenue. The most promising avenue would be, pure intellectually, the European Commission, namely uh, somebody which is outside reach, which has however, the legal powers under certain conditions to operate, including, you know, when, when a market is defined to be global, you know the consequences. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, antitrust uh, uh, should outsource to, to Brussels uh, for the, the digital platforms, but at least prepare the conditions uh, for a, a mutually agreed understanding on, how, uh, on how to go about this business. And then this might work the other way around if a case happens to be centered in, 
uh, Washington. So I apologize for this uh, daring intrusion into uh, a, a, an, a, an agenda of this committee, which I will, uh, if uh, Luigi allows me, continue to um, follow from far away with interest and admiration. Thank you very much. Now uh, a few minutes until we set up the panel. Thank you. Right away, as soon as possible. Right away. Don't leave. I can just use uh, either um, this or this. Yep, you can use anything you want if okay. you just want to go with the clicker. Yep, okay, great, that's probably easiest. It's up to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much to Professor Monti for, for his remarks. We have another busy day today ahead of us. Uh, as, as promised, it's going to be a, two different topics. So we start with a, a panel on data protection, two panels on data protection. That will finish with two panels on the discussion yesterday. They started yesterday on how to save the news media industry. So um, the same structure as yesterday. First, a presentation by we have two subcommittee members with us. We have Lior, who was the chair. We have Florencia from NYU. Then we have two terrific commentators who are Omri and Terrell. So, your, it's Great. all yours. So, thanks everybody. Thanks, Filippo. Um, let's talk about privacy. Let's talk about security. Uh, I had a really terrific team of computer scientists, legal scholars, economists, um, psychologists helping us uh, to produce. So, this is very much a collective effort. I also want to say it's very much a first draft. So our draft will not go live at the end of at the end of the panel. We think of this as very much an opportunity to get uh, feedback from all of you and then revise so that we can put the final draft and share it with the world in uh, towards the end of June. Um, all right. So I don't know that I need to belabor the point. We had a really terrific set of conversations yesterday and last night about some of the privacy challenges that the world faces today. Um, we haven't talked much about data breaches, but the uh, the trend lines on data breaches suggest uh, very significant increases even, even, the, uh, even over the last decade, and the scope of the data breaches just gets larger and larger. Beyond that, when we and our committee thought about the challenges of privacy, uh, we thought that oftentimes um, the default terms, either offered by law or by a platform or an app, were ones that uh, were likely to be uh, fairly raw deals for consumers, and that as a result of the way that people are inter interacting with platforms and with apps, they're often making what the legal system deems choices that don't actually reflect their own preferences, expectations, et cetera. Uh, moreover, I think a particularly big problem here and a real reason why some of the traditional approaches to privacy regulation have not worked is they simply demand too much of consumers who are not experts um, and have a lot of other things to worry about um, but are frequently asked to make decisions about highly technical matters. Um, this will sort of pick up on the strain from yesterday. While we think that market competition can be a healthy force in privacy and security, we don't think it's anywhere near 
a solution, and some of the reasons why involve the very significant externalities associated with privacy. Uh, if, um, to use one example, share their uh, genetic information with 23andMe, uh, they've not only disclosed their information, they've disclosed my information, uh, all of my descendants' information. And uh, uh, many times, as we'll talk about a little, as we get a little bit later, if there's a data breach at one company, that will create all kinds of problems for other companies and other consumers. Um, uh, if you think about sort of a consumer taking matters into their own hands and trying to punish a company over bad data or security practices, that works really nicely, maybe, with uh, consumer-facing companies. But a lot of the most powerful companies in this space are, let's say, data brokers who don't have any direct relationship with consumers. And therefore, the question is, if a consumer wanted to take their business elsewhere, do they have any effective way of doing that? And in the data security space, there's a lot of uh, reasons why market competition uh, is helpful but inadequate. And one of these is simply that uh, this is a highly technical subject matter. Firms that are at the cutting edge of data security have some incentive not to actually broadcast what they're doing because there's no way to meaningfully convey that information to consumers without conveying the same information to hostile actors. So what we're trying to do here is not replicate GDPR, replicate the recent California legislation. We're not trying to provide a comprehensive privacy bill of rights or anything like that. Instead, what we're trying to do are identify three big problems in privacy and security and offer what we think of as helpful and uh, novel solutions to those problems. Um, having said that, what's going on in the rest of the world is part of why we're doing what we're doing and why we believe there's some urgency to it. So the United States is becoming increasingly out of step with mo what most of the industrialized world is doing on privacy, um, setting aside China. Uh, and um, the, the real challenges from the perspective are looking forward five or 10 years is we've already seen at least uh, the European courts once hold that the United States data protection regime was inadequate. Wouldn't it all surprise us if that happened again in fairly short order? And so if there's not greater harmonization between what's happening in the US and what's happening with our primary trading partners, then there's a real risk of, tr of shutting down the transatlantic and trans-Pacific uh, flow of data. Um, having said that, uh, I think uh, some members of the committee are uh, worried about aspects of the GDPR um, with one respect, whether it translates well into the American legal system, uh, how much discretion it gives, how much vagueness is embedded in GDPR, uh, et cetera. Okay, so uh, the first issue I want to talk about, and actually the issue I'll spend the most time talking about, are dark patterns. And uh, uh, Luigi uh, uh, and Chris talked a little bit about that uh, at dinner last night. Uh, it's a phrase that some of you know, if you come from a computer science tradition, you've probably heard a lot about dark patterns. If not, I promise you, you've seen dark patterns before, and what I'll do is just give you a vocabulary to describe what you've seen uh, before. So I've thrown a definition up on the slide, um, but what we're basically talking about are user interfaces that are designed to confuse users, uh, make it difficult for them to express their actual preferences, or manipulating them into taking an action that they prefer not to take. And we're at the University of Chicago Business School, so an important nod uh, should go in the direction of Dick Thaler and also his co-author, Kath Sunstein, who developed a really you know, wonderful set of ideas called nudges. And I think what Thaler would say about dark patterns is they're a form of sludge or a nudge uh, for, uh, for evil. Um, and they tend to, these dark patterns are going to tend to uh, discourage system two decision making, deliberative decision making, and encourage more impulsive uh, system one decision making. All right, so what I'm going to show you are a couple of examples of dark patterns in the wild. If you're interested, there's a couple of websites that aggregate all kinds of dark patterns. This is an example of the confusion strategy, and I don't think I need to explain why it's confusing. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the graphic, it'll become quite apparent that you're likely to leave consumers, especially if they're somewhat pressed for time, making the wrong selection, the one that doesn't reflect their values. Uh, here's another example of a dark pattern. This is, well, I'd like to unsubscribe from all the emails you're sending me. And the company says, sure, no problem. Uh, here's 48 checkboxes. I think 42 are on the slides, mm -hmm. excuse me. Here's 42 checkboxes. We're not going to create a button that you can press to say unsubscribe from all emails. 
So if you'd like to stop getting all emails from us, you're merely going to need to uncheck these 42 boxes in order to proceed. Um, all right. This will seem like a little bit of a digression, but I, prob I promise it's not. It's a really lovely day in Chicago. The conference will end uh, this evening. What should you do? Well, one thing you might find very appealing is you can stroll down to our lakefront and check out a wonderful exhibition about the life of Alexander Hamilton with narrative by Lin-Manuel Miranda. So this is one of the good tourist attractions in Chicago right now. Why, are, why am I talking about this? Well, last weekend I bought tickets for my family to go uh, attend the uh, Lin-Manuel uh, branded Hamilton exhibition. And I want to walk you through uh, what it was like to buy those tickets from Ticketmaster. So initially, they're not putting up much friction in the transaction. But as you get to the end of the transaction, you'll encounter a very classic dark pattern, which is an effort to sell you ticket insurance. You'll see this anytime you ever book a, a flight or anything like that. So the two options here are, uh, yes, I want insurance, or no, I don't want uh, ticket insurance in case I'm unable to attend for some reason. But let's look at how the choices are structured. Yes is in green. Uh, OK, that seems to be doing something. Um, but if you uh, select the top option, you're told, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to protect my ticket purchase. And then in bold letters, highly recommended. OK, that's important. Highly recommended by whom? Well, by Ticketmaster. But it turns out that this might actually have an effect on people, and we'll show you some data on that. You're also reminded there's peer pressure here. Another Ticketmaster customer just protected their purchase a minute ago. And if you go down and select no, you'll be told actually 93,829 people protected their purchases in the last seven days with a quote from Tanya H. in Alpharetta, Georgia, we'll never purchase tickets without it again. All right, so if you understand the psychology of here, you clearly uh, recognize that this is not a choice about which Ticketmaster is neutral. Okay, I rejected the insurance. I made it to this screen. Okay, you bought the tickets. Hey, uh, we'd like to share your information with um, uh, an outside vendor. Uh, in this case, let's please give us permission to sign you up for 30 days of Hulu. And look at the graphic interface. Yes, please is in blue, bright letters. No thanks is in gray letters. That may make a difference. No, I don't want Hulu. Uh, OK. How about a subscription to a razor company? Uh, we'll sign you up for that. You can redeem it. No, I, I don't want razors. Um, hotels.com, can we interest it? These were all in sequence. I'm not making this up. I don't want hotels.com. Uh, well, what about Priceline? Well, Priceline's really similar to hotels.com. If I'd wanted one, I would have wanted the other. And finally, after saying no to all four of these prompts, to share my information and sign me up for something that I really didn't want and that isn't germane, to purchasing tickets through Ticketmaster, I'm finally done. And I'm told by Ticketmaster, OK, you can now go to the Ticketmaster app and access the electronic uh, ticket, which you will then scan when you try to get in the show. So I do that. And I'm then greeted with a pop-up ad that says, we'd really like to send you push notifications. Would you like push notifications? And there are two options, yes or maybe later. <laughs> so what's the missing option there? And why isn't it available? Uh, OK, so uh, this is sort of the setup for when our committee convened, I think um, a number of the committee members, uh, uh, Paul Ohm, Jonathan Mazur, uh, Blaise Orr, were really just um, concerned about dark patterns. And I think what we very quickly identified was that this was not only a privacy problem, a contracting problem in general, but a particular privacy problem that the scholarly community just didn't know nearly enough about. So what we decided to do, um, and I was assisted uh, in this effort by a fantastic uh, PhD psychologist who's about to earn her JD at the University of Chicago, Jamie Liguri, who's here. Uh, what we wanted to do was supplement the existing literature and actually try to test some of, our, some of these dark patterns on a census-weighted representative sample of US adults and figure out uh, how much of a difference they make. Uh, we're going to be publishing in a much lengthier academic paper a version of the data plus a lot more uh, over the summer, and that'll be called uh, Shining a Light on Dark Patterns. All right, so this is what we did. What we essentially um, uh, did is we started out consu uh, confusing consumers as to what we were really after. We spent about, uh, we had, had consumers, they were compensated for their time, spent about 10 minutes giving us a whole bunch of information about their demographics, who they were, 
and then also what their expectations and beliefs were about a variety of different uh, privacy problems. And after collecting all this data, we showed them a screen that said, we're now calculating your privacy propensity score. And it turns out that everyone who took our survey, by design, was told, oh, turns out you care a lot about your privacy. Good news, uh, we've uh, signed you up with our corporate partners to receive a data protection plan that'll guard you against identity theft and allow you to monitor your credit uh, more easily. This was a ruse. We hadn't actually analyzed their privacy propensity scores at all. We also told them that analyzing all the demographic data that they'd given us, as well as using their IP address, we were able to um, I identify their mailing address, so as to make it more plausible that they had, in fact, been signed up for this thing. Uh, and we also randomly varied whether the co what the cost was going to be. Everyone was told that the first six months were going to be free, like the Hulu offer that Ticketmaster showed you. But half the respondents were told that after six months, the monthly charge would be $2.99, and half were told it was going to be triple that, $8.99. Then we randomly assigned our subjects to one of three conditions, a control group that was going to have an easy yes-no decision, a group that was going to be exposed to mild dark patterns, and another third was going to be exposed to aggressive dark patterns. So the control group is sort of a fairly neutral framework. We said, we've just signed you up for this. Do you want it or not? And if they declined it, then they were basically done with this part of the survey, and then we were going to go ask some more questions, uh, make sure that they were spending about as much time on the survey as the people in the other conditions were. All right, what did the mild dark pattern condition look like? Well, we made it a little bit harder for people. All right, so what we did is we asked at the first, in the first instance, do you wish to accept or decline the data protection plan? And we used that tool, one you've seen before, of making the company's preferred option be the recommended choice. And we had the box be pre-selected so that if someone simply clicked next, then they will have accepted the data protection plan. Uh, no is not an option, but other options was an option. And for those people in the mild dark patterns condition, if they selected, my, if they selected other options, then they were going to see one more screen, one that required them to either say, I do not want to protect my data or credit history, which is a little bit psychologically loaded by design. Or second, after reviewing my options on second thought, yeah, go ahead and uh, sign me up. For the people in the mild condition, there was one more screen where we just asked them to tell us why they declined the protection, but it turns out that didn't uh, do very much in convincing people who were otherwise inclined to say no to say yes. All right, what about the aggressive dark pattern condition, the third of the sample that saw this? Uh, same first two screens as the ones I just described in the mild, pa in the mild dark pattern condition, but uh, they're going to see some additional screens as well. Okay? So if they s said no on the first two screens, then we were going to show them up to three additional screens where we were going to give them uh, about a paragraph of text about identity theft, how bad it is, how frequently, occur, how frequently it occurs, what happens if it does occur. And at the bottom of each of those screens, there was a countdown timer that required them to stay on the screen for 10 seconds before they could advance to the next one. And there were two options, one that said, accept the data protection plan and continue. The other says, I would like to read more information. Because after all, everyone would like to read more <laughs> information. Uh, in, so in order to decline, they needed to make it through these three additional screens. And then in the aggressive dark pattern condition, they were going to see one more. And I think we're basically describing what Ticketmaster did. Um, uh, then uh, on this final screen, uh, we again use some of the sort of psychological pleading tactics. Well, we won't be able to protect you if you say no. You might be victimized if you say no. We're trying to implicate um, feelings of regret. And then, we say, and then we say, are you sure you want to decline this free identity theft protection? No, cancel, or yes. And the thought is that some people are going to say no, cancel, thinking that they'll say that they're declining the plan. But in fact, if they do that, literally, they'd be accepting the plan. Um, okay. Regardless of which condition you were in, you saw the same final screens where we're going to ask you questions like, how free did you feel to decline the data protection plan? Um, would you be interested in doing follow-up research by the same researchers? Uh, please describe your mood uh, between extremely annoyed and extremely happy. And then do you have any questions or comments about the survey? All right. So were these things effective? Yes, they were really effective. Uh, at least, uh, I don't know what your priors were. Uh, I was surprised by the magnitude of the effects. So really, there's two columns here. There's a sort of statistical question. As I'll, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we did, especially in the aggressive dark patterns condition, 
have a lot of people drop out of the study during those screens where we made them see a whole bunch of data and then wait for 10 seconds. So if you want to treat those people as trying to decline the uh, data protection plan, you're interested in the third column, adjusted acceptance rate. If you want to just focus on those people who made it all the way through and treat people who dropped out as neither accepting nor declining, then you're going to be interested in the acceptance rate. But either way you cut it, we've got mild dark patterns more than doubling the acceptance rate and aggressive dark patterns more than tripling the acceptance rate just based on the choice architecture that we employed in trying to elicit their preference. Now, because of the way that Jamie set up the experiment, we're able to figure out precisely which of these dark patterns were most effective. And it turns out that across all conditions, it's that first screen, okay? Not a decision between yes or no, but a decision between yes and something else, and putting either recommended or highly recommended in the frame so as to indicate to consumers that that's what they're supposed to do. In the mild dark pattern condition, that accounted, just that first screen accounted for uh, three quarters of the acceptances. In the aggressive dark pattern condition, where after all, people had more opportunities to, to accept, it accounted for almost two thirds of the acceptances. Giving people a second chance also proved pretty effective at swaying people away from uh, declining the, the protection. Uh, and then as we go through the additional screens that only the aggressive dark pattern people saw, if you combine the three screens with lots of text and the annoying countdown timer, that accounted for a little under 20% of the acceptances. And then the very confusing yes, cancel screen at the end accounted for a little bit more than 10% of the acceptances in that sample. Okay, another thing that we're really interested in having discovered that these dark patterns are quite effective at bending a significant number of consumers to the company's will was who's falling for this? Uh, and so because we had collected a lot of demographic information, we were able to uh, make some progress on that question. And going into the project, our strongest prediction was about education levels and that hypothesis, which was that less educated Americans would be more likely uh, to have their choices manipulated by dark patterns was borne out by the data. So in the easy condition, no dark pattern, uh, there's no correlation between education and how willing people were to accept the plan. But as soon as we get to the dark patterns conditions, edu uh, less educated people are much more likely to accept the plan. So uh, you see on the slide um, that in the dark patterns conditions, uh, you can simply compare uh, people on the one hand who never attended college, so high school education and below, with people who um, graduated college or uh, finished a graduate degree. And you're seeing very significant uh, differences. Uh, in the mild condition, it's 34% of the less educated sample versus 21% of the highly educated sample. Uh, the, the magnitude of the effect's a little smaller, uh, but still sizable in the hard, dark pattern condition. And then once we controlled for um, income and other demographic factors, the statistically significant differences on education went away in the hard, dark pattern condition but not in the mild dark pattern condition. And I wanna talk about that a little bit later. Now, one thing you might think is, gee, uh, Lior, when Ticketmaster made you click through all those screens, they probably ticked you off. And the truth is that they did, and that may, m might make me marginally less willing to use Ticketmaster to buy tickets going forward, although it's Ticketmaster, so I won't really have a choice if I wanna see a particular show. Um, so one of the things we were really interested in getting at is trying to figure out whether, um, uh, people were really annoyed by the dark patterns, and if so, uh, which ones? And so one of the things I mentioned earlier is that user engagement is likely to suffer from the use of aggressive dark patterns. Uh, we randomly assigned people, but the dropout rate among people who saw aggressive dark patterns was hugely higher than the dropout rate among those who saw only the mild uh, dark pattern. Uh, when we asked people about their moods, what was interesting was that people who signed up for the data protection plan regardless of whether they saw the straightforward, easy, yes, no, or a dark pattern, they were all uh, statistically uh, comparable to one another. There were no significant differences. But among people who wound up declining the plan, the people who were in the aggressive dark pattern condition were really, really angry, at least on the seven point Likert scale. Uh, and the people in the mild dark pattern plan who wound up rejecting it were not significantly angry. Uh, there were not differences that were significant between them and the dark and the and the control group at least across uh, I think three out of the four specifications that we used 
This shows up in the qualitative data as well. Remember, we asked an open-ended question, can you tell us anything about the experiment? And the aggressive dark pattern people gave us a whole bunch of expletives. Uh, the mild dark pattern people, by and large, uh, did not. Now, um, we're sort of academic researchers creating a simulated environment. We're not a platform that has uh, lots and lots of market power. We have no market power whatsoever. Um, and so, you know, my sense is, uh, and there's some reason to, to believe that among the digital platforms that are employing these techniques, that um, uh, the ability of consumers to retaliate uh, is substantially lessened. What are you going to do? Leave Facebook? Okay, so uh, the normative takeaway from this experiment for us then was that regulators need to be most concerned, if anything, about the mild dark patterns. Because the mild dark patterns are quite effective but they don't generate the kind of consumer backlash that we saw in the aggressive dark pattern case. And if we think about the distributive consequences of dark patterns uh, on the basis of education, again, it's the mild that seem particularly problematic. And we came away thinking, at least for me, should, I'm curious to know whether you were surprised, we thought dark patterns were surprisingly uh, uh, potent in getting people to sign up for a bogus and sort of vague data protection plan, that there's no reason to think that they would have uh, actually uh, wanted. Um, all right, I think that digital platforms and other sites have done beta testing and figured this out. My suspicion is we see so many dark patterns in the wild precisely because these kinds of techniques have been internally uh, tested. Uh, but academic researchers, at least as far as we can tell, uh, are playing catch up. And so we hope that this contribution is a way uh, to, to uh, start to catch up to what kind of research has already been done internally. Now I think normatively, we then get into an interesting uh, legal question and a philosophical question. Persuasion is fine, persuasion is protected by the First Amendment, manipulation is bad and not, and so the question is, can we differentiate permissible persuasion from impermissible manipulation? And I guess what we, what we came away with, especially informed by the data, was that you could actually design a pretty good and easy legal test for which kind of dark pattern manipulations ought to be unlawful. And the test is simply that when you do the kind of beta testing that Jamie Liguori and I did, and it turns out that most of the people who are accepting the corporate preferred term are doing so because of the choice architecture, not because of a substantive desire for the program or policy at issue, then that should be the kind of dark pattern that we don't recognize as having established consumer consent and that per se the law could regard as an unfair or deceptive practice in trade. Now we want to caveat that a little bit. You need a lot of statistical power in order when you're dealing with sort of a, a neutral condition acceptance rate of 1%. Uh, if, the, if the dark pattern manipulation shows you 3%, you're going to, you know, we're basically going to um, caveat this sub subject to confidence intervals. But, you know, given enough uh, statistical power, we ought to be able to identify any problematic dark pattern that meets that threshold. Now, that's not to say that that's a perfect test. We think that per se test would probably need to be supplemented with something that's a little bit more of a standard than a rule, because after all, a dark pattern that shifted an acceptance rate from 25% in the control group to 45% in the dark pattern manipulation still seems pretty problematic. Um, and uh, uh, you'd, need to, you'd need to think about a more um, context sensitive kind of rule than a per se rule where the decisions are not binary, where the frameworks are not binary. And so in thinking about a non per se approach to tamping down on dark patterns, the variables of interest to us are how hidden the dark pattern is, how vulnerable people are, and whether demographic targeting is being used. All right, so that brings us to the second platform in our uh, dark pattern, which is how to, determine the content, how to determine the substance of default rules. What to do when uh, contracts between platforms and individuals are uh, silent. And uh, in those instances, this is something where GDPR has uh, done something very important. Article 25 has embraced a, pres uh, a provision called privacy uh, by default. We think privacy by default has a lot to recommend it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it might not always be optimal because the way that privacy by default, at least uh, to my eyes, is written, it might not appropriately take account of all of the relevant 
uh, context. So by that I mean the following. There's going to be some instances in which consumers want to store their data, uh, and they want to store their data in a way that um, uh, where, their, where their baseline expectations, their baseline preferences, are probably inconsistent with privacy by default. So think about a photo, an online photo archiving site. Well, people don't want those photos deleted after a year or after two years. At least most people don't. And as you go through e-commerce, you can probably identify some other instances like that. So what we want to say is, let's actually see if we can use consumer preferences and consumer expectations as a starting point for figuring out what the default rules should be. A really important caveat is that we think there's a broad swath of territory, maybe a broader swath of territory, where default rules are not the right way to go, where mandatory rules, in other words, unwaivable rights, are the right way to go. And so we're only talking about a slice of um, our interactions with platforms. Now, the sort of standard economic uh, approach to default rules is to look for what, what uh, law and economic scholars call majoritarian default rules. Those default terms that are favored by the majority of contracting parties, that's great if you can find them. Because after all, if you just go with the de majoritarian default rule, you save the parties the transaction costs of hammering out any specific uh, agreement. And then to the extent that there are people who have heterogeneous, have heterogeneous preferences, idiosyncratic preferences, they can uh, contract out of the default rule. The problem is that a lot of the settings that we're talking about, especially with respect to privacy, we're in a situation where consumers are going to want one thing and the platforms or the firms are going to want something else. And in those circumstances, there are no majoritarian default rules. So our approach in the presentation and in the working paper is uh, to move towards what we call consumeritarian default rules, which focus not so much on the mutual preferences, but rather on the, on the preferences of the unsophisticated party to the transaction, the party that has less um, of an ability to, to um, uh, craft uh, uh, personalized, um, non-off-the-rack terms, and the party that spends less time thinking about what the appropriate defaults uh, should be. So the basic framework we start off with is, let's figure out where consumers are. Let's provide uh, firms and platforms with the opportunities to convince those consumers to opt into something else, presumably something that's friendlier to the interests of firms and platforms. But let's make it so that those requests to waive rights that are given by default have to be quite narrow in their scope. In other words, you can't bundle together a whole series of decisions, some good that the consumer will like, some bad that the consumer would, would dislike in order to stick them with the disliked terms. Moreover, we want to make sure that the interfaces that are used to secure these opt-outs of the default rules are non-manipulative, and we think the work we just showed you on dark patterns helps illustrate what non-manipulation uh, might uh, look like. The basic idea here is that we want to make it costly, cumbersome, for firms to be able to obtain from consumers these opt-outs of their default legal protections. So it's going to impose non-trivial costs on firms to get away from the defaults. And the design is basically designed not so much to inform consumers, but rather to deter them from imposing on consumers' time in the same way that Ticketmaster was imposing on my time last week. All right, so um, here's uh, some data. And again, this is from the same study that uh, Liguri and I, Jamie Liguri and I did. Uh, this was sort of the first 10 minutes. This was the ruse to get people to give us the dark pattern stuff that we were interested in at the end of the survey. And what we did is we asked consumers randomly either a series of normative questions or a series of descriptive questions about uh, their privacy preferences and presented some binary questions, some questions on a seven point uh, Likert scale. Um, to be clear, no dark patterns until after our subjects are done giving us all the information that we used in this part of the study for this part of the paper. So uh, we gave them vignettes about Amazon, Facebook, Google's uh, practices. And we asked half the sample, um, is Amazon or Google allowed to do this? The other half of the sample, should Amazon or Google legally be allowed to do this? And what we see are that there are some instances, like the ones we've got on this slide, where there's a little bit of an is-ought divergence where consumers think, OK, Google is doing this, but they ought not to be able to. Um, and what we generally found is when we tried to uh, explain to consumers the rationale for Google collecting your data, Facebook collecting your data, that actually didn't provide um, 
uh, that didn't do much to shift consumers either normative or descriptive uh, data that pr they provided to us. On the other hand, there were some settings, and encryption really jumped out at us, there were some settings where consumers' normative expectations and their descriptive expectations were quite consistent with one another. Basically, consumers expect that private information they hand over, whether they be to platforms or to startups, because we randomly uh, varied that as well, uh, that that's going to be encrypted, that anything sensitive is going to be encrypted by the firm. Uh, consumers very strongly feel that that ought to be the case, but most consumers also descriptively believe that that is, in fact, the case, that that is what the law requires. Now, that's an erroneous assumption in some contexts. Okay. Now, in other contexts, consumers tell us that at least the majority of them don't expect privacy and don't prefer privacy. And so in our vignettes, the examples where this showed up most clearly were those involving geolocation information, whether that was geolocation done via GPS by Google Maps, or whether it was geolocation done via cell tower location uh, for Verizon uh, wireless uh, customers. In both of these contexts, both the normative and descriptive answers suggested that the majority of consumers were comfortable with the collection of this information, at least in certain contexts. So the caveat to this is our consumers told us that they were quite comfortable with Google Maps collecting information while the app was being used. But they also told us that if Google Apps, before, you know, as you were installing the app, got your permission to monitor your geolocation whenever your phone was on, that people's agreement to that provision, um, as a normative matter, ought not to give Google the permission to track your location whenever your phone is activated, but when the app, Google Maps, is not in use. Okay, there's a lot more work to be done on this. Uh, this was really just a first uh, cut, sort of a pilot test collect more data, refine the questions, determine under what circumstances we care more about normative consumer responses versus descriptive consumer responses. Um, uh, uh, some of the members of the committee have done a lot of research about the connections between those two, and I think there's a widespread belief out there that descriptive expectations drive normative preferences, and the, I think the majority of the data that's been collected on that question suggests that's not the case. Uh, we do think this can help inform uh, FTC uh, and state consumer protection judgments about what counts as an unfair or deceptive uh, practice in trade. And we think this is sort of an alternative, maybe a more palatable to American audiences, but perhaps more effective even, alternative to what GDPR is doing in Article 25. And then briefly, in the couple of minutes I've got left, let me just talk about the third uh, part of our uh, proposal, which is going to focus not on privacy, but on uh, data security. And a huge problem in data security, and uh, Blaze Orr is, uh, is in the room, and he's, uh, I think, the, uh, the leading expert uh, on this topic. A leading problem, a leading vulnerability is about uh, password reuse, okay? So um, you don't have to admit it out loud, admit it to yourself. Uh, it's possible that some of you either use identical passwords or very similar pass passwords across a variety of different platforms and uh, sites. Some people use password managers, that's really great. Most people uh, don't, and password managers have some issues of their own. And so it turns out that this is a very prevalent practice among consumers, um, and as a result, there's substantial negative externalities that can be created. If Yahoo is breached, and people have the same login for Yahoo as they have for Facebook, then all of a sudden the hackers who've obtained people's Yahoo credentials might be able to log in in an unauthorized way and extract all kinds of data from Facebook. And this becomes particularly problematic if we're thinking about financial institutions. Okay, some of the platforms try to protect themselves against this problem by buying credentials from the hackers. Okay, well, you can think about perverse effects, uh, per perverse incentives that, cr that get created by that, but it's understandable why the platforms might do this as a way to protect their customers and to protect themselves. Now, in the full report, we marched through a couple of different candidates for what the best policy intervention on this might be. We talk about CISA, which is a 2015 um, federal statute that's designed to promote information sharing among, um, uh, among firms with respect to cybersecurity threats. We ultimately think that there's a better way forward, and where we come down on is encouraging the creation of a data breach clearinghouse. And what the clearinghouse would do is centralize people's login credentials as reported by platforms and a variety of different other sites so that there would be one point that could identify, oh, it turns out that Lior Strahilovitz is using the same password across these four different platforms, and that's a problem 
so that if people with access to the central clearinghouse learn of a breach at Yahoo, and it turns out that my Yahoo credentials being used for all these other sites, the consumer could be alerted, but that's not really going to do that much. But more importantly, the sophisticated platforms could be alerted so that they could take uh, corrective measures. There have been recent advances in private set membership testing that uh, facilitate uh, these kinds of techniques. In other words, would allow Google, Facebook to ping the central database without, in so doing, acquire private information that, um, uh, that people had shared uh, with other platforms or other sites. And actually, uh, Google Password Checkup Extension is now using somewhat similar uh, techniques in order to further these laudable objectives. Now, the main source of concern here is that by creating a central database, you're creating a single point of failure. So God forbid someone manages to breach this database. And uh, obviously, uh, this is a database that needs to get the highest levels of data uh, protection in order to ensure that that doesn't happen. Having said that, the committee considered these trade-offs uh, and believed that ultimately, notwithstanding that potential cost, uh, this is uh, a justified uh, policy intervention. So to summarize the three uh, solutions that, uh, that we propose, uh, first, a new framework not only for identifying but also regulating dark patterns. Second, implementing consumeritarian default rules uh, with platforms and other sites that uh, do uh, uh, direct work with consumers online. And then finally, the creation of the privacy clearinghouse. Uh, thanks for listening, and I look forward to uh, commentary and all of your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Terrell, you're next. Okay, great. Wow, thank you. That was that was fabulous. And um, I, I, the paper's not up yet, right? Correct. So um, uh, I've had a chance to review a draft of it. It is really, really interesting work, and um, I encourage everybody to check it out once it is up. But that was a great, great preview of it. Um, I think my task is to react a little bit, and and so I want to do that for a few minutes, and then we have uh, others that will as well. And and then I think it'd be great to have a dialogue about what we've just heard as mm -hmm. well. So. I'm going to react very, very quickly. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, disclaiming that what I'm saying is my, my own personal view, definitely not the views of Covington and Burling, the law firm I now work for, or any of my clients. Um, so I, uh, I thought this was a really interesting contribution to the overall policy discussion and, uh, that we have around privacy, but also around when we think about sort of a competition framework, whether competition enforcers can interact meaningfully with privacy, because we all wrestle with that fundamental privacy paradox, this issue of people expressing one preference and then acting in a very different way, and what do we do with that, right? How do we understand fundamentally what people really want to have happen with their data? Um, and, and also, if I, could, if I could just sort of summarize the I think what underpins the three relatively different areas that are explored in the paper is this notion that a lot of our frameworks um, are really re overly relying on people to both anticipate unwanted and unanticipated or even potentially harmful uses of their data um, and or take steps to protect themselves and their passwords and not reuse passwords, right? So there's a huge amount of fallibility in the system. Um, you know. We're all familiar with the expression that a fool and a, his money are easily parted. I think if I could summarize this paper, it would be a completely rational, totally reasonable consumer, and her data can be easily parted as well. Thank you. Someone laughed at my UDAP <laughs> joke, and I really appreciate that. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm saying totally rational and reasonable consumer, of course, is those are the frameworks that we use in consumer protection law and deception and unfairness to decide uh, whether someone um, is uh, given adequate information if they're acting reasonably, et cetera. Um, and, the, and the paper really points out some of the limitations of that approach. Some of the limitations of, of notice and choice as well, uh, you didn't do well on it, but it, it takes a good firm shot in the paper at notice and choice and, and, and whether that is a, a reasonable framework to have in a digital economy. And, and I think overall is, is, is calling into question um, the rational choice theory, which is essentially the underpinning of consumer protection law in the United States, which is, which is essentially the assumption that properly informed, reasonable consumers and individuals will make rational choices and reasonable decisions regarding 
what they buy and how they spend their data, if you will, and how they transact in the marketplace, and, and that um, because they're properly informed, therefore the market will react to that accordingly, and everybody will be better off. Um, you know, I think we have, over time, started to understand and evolve, um, especially here in the US um, and at the Federal Trade Commission, my former agency, our understanding of, of, um, of whether and how to protect consumers in an environment where, where that is challenged on a routine basis. Um, and by that I mean the, the FTC, with its deception authority and its unfairness authority, has moved into the space, although incrementally and sort of slowly over time, uh, and relatively reactively, um, in, in terms of looking at um, deceptive design of consumer interfaces. The paper mentions some of these cases, but I'll throw a few more out there that I think are worth looking at. The FTC's Venmo case, this was a case involving the uh, fact that consumers had to navigate multiple privacy settings in order to not make their transactions on um, a social network uh, payment um, platform public. So uh, are people in here Venmo users? Anybody pay their babysitter with, yeah, okay, or whatever. So those of you that are understand, um, maybe, maybe don't, and um, this is part of what the case is about, understand that the way that platform works, um, you are making public who you're paying and getting to add to descriptions of those payments, which is hilarious and interesting because obviously I'm gonna be generational for a minute. Like what we wanna do is make all of our payments to our friends and other people in our lives public and share those. Um, <laughs> that's clear. Uh, so, so what this case was about was, okay, well, um, you have to actually like, navigate multiple settings to not have the people you're transacting with make your um, payments that you're trying to make private public so they could publicize them essentially through their own uh, networks. Um, and so, so that was what that case was about. Also Vizio, which is a case involving connected televisions. This is one of the FTC's first IoT cases. And there the issue was um, the television was collecting uh, millisecond by millisecond precise viewing data of everything that was on the screen. So no matter where the, where the video was coming from, whether it was a game console, a cable connection, some other connection, it was collecting that information. It could identify what you were watching, cool, and then send it back uh, to Vizio. And the way to not have that setting collect that information was to go through an interface that was called the smart interactivity uh, uh, interface. So that, that was, in that case, um, you know, I think clearly not adequate to, to, to allow people to make a choice about whether they wanted that kind of very precise granular viewing information about coming from their screen to be shared back with the television manufacturer and ultimately, ultimately monetized. The FTC has also used its unfairness authority, and, and the paper touches on this a little bit, but I also think this is a little bit where you were going with, um, with okay, how do we think about dark patterns and whether um, the current consumer protection framework can either address them in deception, in some of the ways I was just talking about, or unfairness. Um, unfairness is, it, it's a harder authority in this space for sure, um, but the FTC has used it in a series of, of privacy and data related cases, um, including collection and use of information and knowing violation of a privacy policy, selling confidential phone records without consent, designing software that causes consumers to unwittingly share files publicly, defeating privacy choices by consumers, that's InMobi, which I think you do reference, installing spyware without notification or consent, selling information to businesses, uh, they're using it for fraud, unfair tracking without consent, revenge porn, um, failure to maintain reasonable security, of course, in those data security cases. So I think one of the, the questions is really, um, are some of these dark patterns significant enough uh, or, or deceptive enough that in fact they're already actionable under consumer protection law. And of course, I'm talking about the federal US law, but there is also state consumer protection law that is um, uh, relatively consistent with the, with the federal framework. Um, and then getting into the, the more challenging question here, I think ultimately, and, and I applaud the paper for attempting to design a legal test. I think that's always really rewarding. It's good to see the problem explained and the data underpinning it. Uh, but it's, it's hard sometimes to then think about how to map that onto 
onto a legal framework. Um, you know, I think the challenge is ultimately going to be uh, really defining the harm. The harm obviously being, um, you know, conceptual manipulation, but the challenge is gonna be some percentage of the people are actually choosing something and then receiving what they chose, right? And, and in your hypothetical, it's uh, a service. So then they're getting that, right? So, so okay, how, how are they harmed? And the harm question really comes down to, well, they wouldn't have done it otherwise, right? And I think that that's um, something that this paper helps both inform, but will be something that legally people will wrestle with. I just wanted to skip through quickly to default rules. Um, the paper has a really interesting discussion around default rules. You covered it really quickly. Uh, consumeritarian default rules. You know, I think this is the the real challenge here is that right now we've already been talking about how um, difficult it is to rely so heavily on end users and consumers to act rationally and transact with systems that they don't totally understand. Um, creating defaults might help in that way, but it also might create enhanced consumer confusion around what the settings are in the first place or which defaults are in place in which situations. Um, I'm a, for example, I'm a relatively privacy sensitive user of technology. It's probably not surprising. Um, my, uh, the, I share my geolocation very sparingly with any apps I use that, um, that really need my geolocation. So mapping apps, ride hailing apps, ride sharing apps, those kinds of things. Um, it can be very, very useful to share your geolocation, especially if you don't exactly know where you are and you're trying to get a car to come pick you up. Um, but I don't leave those on all the time, so I toggle them on and off. Uh, I'm guessing the majoritarian, consumeritarian view of that would be most people would be like, yeah, I share my geolocation with those apps because that's the way they work best for me most easily with the least friction, right? So then I'm a privacy sensitive person. I'm now having to like interact with that default and make sure it's flipped the other way. Uh, you know, I think that's just something to, to think about. Um, lastly, the clearinghouse idea I think is really interesting. Again, underscoring the fact that people uh, People create a lot of security problems by re reusing passwords. This is a big challenge. You, you already hit the nail on the head in terms of the big vulnerability, which is the clearinghouse itself then becomes massive, uh, huge security vulnerability uh, in and of itself. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've seen the consequences of very significant breaches of very rich information like the Equifax breach, which essentially renders people identity insecure I worry about about that vulnerability, um, but you you identified it. So I suppose the brilliant computer security people that will be thinking about how to how to make sure that's a secure environment um, could think about that issue. It would be far better, of course, if we moved off of that whole system into something much stronger. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks uh, for comments. I guess I was invited here because I, I'm not a privacy scholar. I'm a law professor. I'm a colleague of Lior. And in the spirit of University of Chicago, I'm going to disagree with him today. I was invited here because I study more general I I problems of consumer contracting, uh, failures of consumer contracting and techniques on how to address them. And recently, I did take a kind of a, an I made an attempt to think uh, differently about the problem of data protection and data uh, collection in our society. So I try to unify these two things and, see, and um, uh, explain how I differ with the uh, authors of this uh, uh, report. Uh, now, I did not know what they found about dark patterns. I was not that aware of dark patterns, although every time you do check out from buying an airline ticket, you go through a mild dark pattern, you have to buy, decline the junk insurance product that uh, these websites, it never seemed to me to be a big <coughs> problem, but now I realize I undercounted the effect of these things. I don't think that this is a problem of data issues. I think that the urges, urging people to buy add-on products that are not necessary and overpriced at a moment in ways that are somewhat deceptive is a general problem. 
In the world of deception, I think these are relatively mild. I teach deception law, FTC law, and Lanham Act, and you kind of say your jaw drops when you see the things that are done. So this is a little worse than a deceptive uh, product placement on shelves and things like this. It may be significantly worse, but uh, I, and, and it does call for some intervention. But I think that this panel was convened to think about problems of data sharing, data collection, and the uses of data that are done not in deceptive ways, namely that are collected people without dark patterns. I think probably, I don't know the numbers there, but probably the great majority of data that is collected would be collected by the likes of Amazon, um, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and others without the use of uh, um, dark patterns. So that's where the solution that the, 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 the report really has is taking a brave and I think a kind of a significant uh, uh, approach to the, to the problem. So just to summarize, I think that they view the problem in the area of privacy, and this is not focusing specifically on the dark patterns, as loss of, and this is quoting from the report, loss of privacy and control leading to psychological and financial harm to the people whose data is being harvested and used in ways that they have not expected or anticipated. And therefore, the main solutions is to enact consumeritarian default rules, to allow opt-out only in a, in a more kind of informed and persuaded way, persuade people if you want them to opt out, and prohibit these dark patterns to the extent that that also is a part of the problem in the privacy context. Um, so I like the point about prohibiting dark patterns, although I'm not exactly sure how uh, to conceptualize the, you know, what do you uh, forbid uh, people to sell, but uh, let's f think about that separately. I want to take, uh, spend a couple of minutes um, I, talking about my problems with the solutions, and in the end, if I have time, I'll say a couple of words about my problem with how the problem is conceptualized. I view the problem differently. Um, so an act consumeritarian default rules, so the report was wants to use consumers' preferred uh, starting point as a default rule, namely identify consumer preferences via surveys and use these preferences as default rules, consumeritarian default rules. And I have here, I just have two questions. First, is there a meaning to stating preferences when not priced? Asking you consumers what they want without asking them what, how much you know, it will be will willing to pay. Uh, when they, especially when these seem to conflict with revealed preferences, and that's what is known as the privacy paradox. People are not behaving in the same way that they state that they're. So that, this whole, the area of contingent valuation in economics has wrestled with these issues. I'm worried that we are replicating some of the con uh, issues that were methodological issues there. And secondly, are these preferences that are reported in issue-specific surveys. In this particular website, what, how much are you willing to pay not to have the... Are they consistent with people's income constraints? Once you ask people in all these contexts, not in individual survey, how much, how important it is to them in terms of their willing to pay part with cash to secure their data currency, and ask them not only in the data area, but in all the other things that are waived in standard contract terms, like in intellectual property rights, rights to sue rather than go to arbitration, you might get to a lot of money that people don't have. So I'm a little concerned about that, uh, the whole idea of identifying consumeritarian default rules by asking uh, consumers. But uh, that's, uh, so that's one issue. Um, uh, as the baseline of the solution seems to be, uh, um, at least needs uh, methodologically to have some, uh, some problems. But then uh, a b bigger issue that I find is to allow opt-out only if informed, so that the report wants to default rules can be waived if firms are able to convince consumers that waiving these rights is worthwhile, enable consumers to make well-informed decisions about trade-offs. Well, I, I wrote a book about these things. It's, it's called More Than You Wanted to Know. It's about the failure of attempts to give people information to make better decisions in all of consumer life, uh, credit, uh, financial decisions, medical decisions, insurance decisions. Uh, Miranda warnings is an attempt to inform consumers before they decide. You know, there are many ways in which the law really favors. It's probably, I, in my book, I thought that I wrote that uh, co-wrote, 
it's a co-written book, uh, we, we thought with my co-author that this is the most common technique in American law to protect people, and at the same time also the least successful. There's just no evidence that it works ever. Um, and the, the, the question here is how do you convince and well inform consumers about the context of data sharing? Um, there are high hopes to this technique. It is not the first time I, I see this, um, and I'll just share with you a quick survey of how, the, how high the hopes are. Um, so uh, distinguished um, writers have written about problem that I dare say is probably more urgent for consumers, which is terrible catastrophic credit decisions that they take, cred credit uh, that they make. Uh, so they say borrowers, they say, should receive the standard mortgage offered. The standard mortgage would be the, the consumertarian mortgage, the plain vanilla risk-free mortgage and uh, offered unless they choose to opt out in favor of another option after the lender's honest and comprehensible disclosures about the risks of alternative mortgages. Um, and in, in order that it would be, it requires a heightened disclosures and in other place they said, actually this is a one size, they call it a one size fits all solution to all consumer issues, pro-consumer default rule and firms must provide meaningful disclosures to those whom they convince to op opt out. And uh, in the context of insurance uh, disclosures, the Consumer Federation of America is pleading for consumers having access to timely and meaningful information about, look at the list of the things that you need to educate people. Insurance is very costly and very complicated. So there are all sorts of efforts on how to do it, how to actually implement this uh, persuasion, convincing, well-informing consumers. In the context of a uh, rental purchase, these are rent to own products that people, you know, poor people make, uh, disastrously make, uh, provide meaningful disclosures to consumers. Uh, online advertising, make clear and consumer conspicuous disclosures. Telemarketers, clear and conspicuous disclosures. Truth in Lending Act, uh, to assure meaningful disclosure of credit terms to the Everybody wants to do, everybody is fighting uh, and look at the Federal Bank of, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia talking about prepaid cards, the f f form of payment uh, method that many poor people use and are taking for a ride paying, you know, a bundle of junk fees and all sorts of scams. So what is the solution? Well, ensuring that card users understand how they work, right? You begin to see the pattern, right? So there is endless advocates and regulators and courts and well-meaning you know, uh, uh, reformers wanting to get into people's mind and educate them, make them well-informed about things that are complex, that you, can't, you will not, have not succeeded in one, not to mention the whole uh, um, you know, potpourri of information that are, is lavished on people in, in order to, to persuade them. Uh, and uh, indeed, the, disappoint real the fact that the reality is disappointing is not uh, surprising. How do you make things, how do you make disclosures meaningful? Everybody is working on it. Simplification, well, yeah, but then people don't see the whole pictures and make bad decisions. Besides, that too doesn't seem to work in, so in a, you know, mountains of empirical evidence as showing disappointing, if not null, results to all sorts of simplification efforts. Um, the problem, I think, is not that there is a kind, there's no magic way to persuade people when something is complex. It takes time and experience to master a complex decision problem and people can't master everything. And that's why that creates problems of overload and accumulation, consent fatigue, uh, decision aversion, and particularly, it is hopeless in low stakes context. I would put first Persuade, teach people to make, take better mortgages. That's the one decision that could ruin their financial life if they make bad. Then start staggering which are more important, less important. I'm not sure, I don't want to take a view on where privacy would stand there, but see what enormous rivals it has for the desire to inform people and to make better decisions. Just one last example. Obama, um, ACA, the Affirmative uh, uh, Care Act, wanted to inform consumers about health plans. You make an important decision mm -hmm. about health plans. So they designed this really nice and simple and informative and launched it with all sorts of in informing and, uh, consumers on how to do it with all sorts of aids. 
Um, and that too, uh, it, it came, the mandate said, that the, the statute said, give people information to make health plans comparable, like nutrition labels, another myth that that really helps people make better decisions, again, not uh, supported by the evidence. Forms were developed and tested in libraries. Everything was done right and was mandated to do this way. But when asked to compare costs in common scenarios, the vast majority of people were still confused in real world, not in the laboratory. They did not understand concepts like deductibles, annual limits, and a long other list of other things. And having to make these determ the determinations based on the disclosures frustrated people, often led them to select, very often led them to select plans not actually in their best interest. So the efforts are there. The thinking to do it is not new. It just is not working, and we don't know how to make it work. And in my view, we cannot make something complex simple, we cannot make people experts in everything. The, uh, so I guess I don't buy into the solution of consumeritarian default rules with informed opt-out. Now, there could be something not informed opt-out, and it's stressed more in uh, Lior's excellent presentation, made me think about, I didn't get it in the report, but I'll just say a few words about it. Say, make it really costly and long and frustrating to opt out. Make people have to not just inf face one pop, GDPR pop-up saying, oh, you know, we have cookies, that you close, that people view not as an information device, of course, but a box to close, a nuisance to close, but do this more and more and more and more times. At some point, people will say, no. We don't agree. We don't do this. What could happen here? One of two things. Informed people will not happen. Let's set that aside. People might be, some people might do it because they really do want to do things on Facebook and they're willing to endure the hassle and the nuisance of closing bu uh, junk boxes. Or they will be deterred in the uh, altogether from using that. Uh, that the you know, they will, be, they will walk away. Maybe firms will begin to separate, select people, but they're not selecting people on the basis of the feature that really matters to us, namely how important is privacy to them. They're selecting people on the basis of how costly it is to them to, uh, they're separating people according to how costly it is to them to endure the hassle, the nuisance. I have to say, I think that if you, the idea is to deter firms from using, from asking for these waivers, why not just, you know, uh, say it? Let's, not, let's prohibit that. It's things that want fir firms to not do uh, come out and say, this is uh, not allowed. I understand that that's not consistent with consumer choice, but harassing consumers into legally mandated dark patterns, namely closing boxes and after boxes that the law mandates platforms to give them, doesn't seem to me to be a, an attractive way to replace a mandatory rule. Finally, if I have a minute or two, I want to talk about the problem. Loss of privacy and control leading to psychological and financial harm. Um, I have a feeling that, or I have a sense that's been kind of brewing in me over the last few years thinking about it, that maybe privacy protection is not exactly the right goal <coughs> to talk about it. Data privacy is viewed as the dominant problem. Harm to the people whose data is taken um, in, and uh, collected, used in ways that ultimately hurts their interest psychologically and financially. But, and then if that is the problem, it seems sensible that privacy protection, protecting these people against the platforms that, pre uh, the predatory platforms would be the organizing principle for solutions. And that's why the GDPR and many solutions mandate, and even this report talks about some form of user control and meaningful contracting. Contract is still the solution. People will contract, will, protect themselves if you just give them the way to contract optimally rather than suboptimally. Um, I view data's harm as a public, not private. I think that the harm is to social environments, not to individuals. The, it is political harm, it information to political and informational ecosystems. I don't think that Cambridge Analytica and whatever harm was caused, if, you know, if that can be measured, is to the people whose data was used, uh, who were fed political lies, but rather to the election, the integrity of our election process. Maybe even these people the, who were manipulated are happy. They don't feel injured, but there is a sense of injury. And in many other contexts, we can talk about it. There is the harm is environmental rather than individual. Um, and sometimes, as in the example that Lior gave of 23andMe, the effect is on other people. 
Now, I'm not, I think that the effect of data is not negative necessarily. There are environmental effects that are positive and sometimes they can orders of magnitude greater than the harms. But if there are harms, there are negative externalities. And there, when we th think about externalities, it is not usually, we don't uh, protect the people who are causing the externalities, who are giving their data, who are driving hammers and saying we have to protect them. We have to protect against them, against their decision. And so to put it bluntly, I think user control and informed out is not the solution if users are creating negative externalities. I understand they are not active participants. They have not sat in smoke-filled rooms and thought, how do we pollute the world? But they are happily using data instead of cash for activity and that causes, that causes harm. And so user, uh, under this idea of data pollution, uh, this paradigm, data givers are not those in need of protection, but those from whom the ecosystem has to be protected. And uh, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be punished. You can do it all through the platforms. But in a way that affects what the platforms make the people do, how they, you may, it causes them to pollute. And so I wrote a paper about this called Data Pollution uh, Working Draft. I'm still thinking about these issues, about kind of thinking about it as an environmental law problem for data protection. They're, like in environmental law, we need prohibitions like the GDPR, but they have to be tailored to identify problems, type of data that is particularly harmful, and to make sure that, like in environmental law, we don't stop innovation. And I think the more kind of interesting for an economist, the more interesting idea is the data tax. Tax the taking of data, so as to reflect, the Pigouvian tax, to reflect its social uh, effect. And in the context of data leaks, like um, oil leaks, like spills, when data, where Equifax loses the data, <coughs> it's ridiculous to say to people, you go and sue for this. Of course, they can't sue, they can't prove causation, they can't prove their injury. But we know roughly, and the FTC has reports that estimate the, uh, rel the uh, proportional effect or the uh, average effect on individuals, 130 million people lost all, they lost uh, all the financial data of 130 mi million Americans. There will be so many uh, identity thefts and frauds occurred, you know, the ratio, the cost, the average cost is so much, can immediately hit uh, the, uh, the spillers, the losers of this that, that engaged, you know, strict liability. It doesn't have to be any, who cares what they did? You lost it, you pay. It turns out to be, I don't know, $100 per file, $25 per file, whatever the estimate, the proportional liability that is based on the data is, would create an incentive to limit these kind of spills. So that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. Lorenzo, <laughs> you respond first, so what do you yes. think? Yes, okay. I, oh, I get to respond? Yes. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you for the terrific and uh, thought provoking. Uh, comments. I will address some of them, um, and, and then I'll, I guess we'll open it for, uh, for questions. So just a quick uh, summary of, of what Lior uh, presented. So there's enough reason to believe, I wasn't at yesterday's panel, but I guess I gave even additional reason uh, to believe that there might be some market failures <coughs> in the context of, of privacy and, uh, and digital platforms on our proposed uh, approaches. We have some uh, potential solutions to address at least some of them, uh, not without challenges, of course, and I'll get, get into that in a second. Well, the first is this idea of mandatory and default rules. One of the uh, most problematic uh, aspects in this space is that there aren't any default rules whatsoever, and so many times uh, regulators are at a loss when they're trying to uh, bring actions against uh, firms engaged in potentially deceptive practices, because many times these practices are not stated in privacy policies, um, and so uh, it's, it's very hard to, um, to use the, their uh, consumer protection uh, arsenal. Uh, Terrell talked about unfairness, uh, which, is, which is a great tool, but it's, it's, it's not used as much because it's harder to, uh, it, it's harder to, to use um, effectively. Deception is, a, is, is another where uh, the uh, Federal Trade Commission and, and state AGs using little FTC acts need to rely on some stated policy, <laughs> some, some stated practices. O omissions uh, are sometimes uh, are, uh, are, are brought, but it's not, it, it's not with the same, uh, it, it's, it's not as, as easily uh, done. 
And the same is true for um, not consumers because they don't really read much, but for intermediaries who might be uh, willing to maybe inform consumers or more likely journalists uh, who then get to inform consumers with uh, shocking uh, news stories. So, so silence in this space is, is problematic and this is where we uh, come up with. And also uh, picking up some mandatory rules to take away from the consumer the responsibility of, of becoming informed and, and continuing to make uh, choices on, on many uh, aspects of their, of their lives, then uh, eliminate their uh, pattern, oh, oops, I'm missing an end there, behavior as a deceptive uh, practice. Um, I'll, I'll get more into it a little bit uh, later. And then address the password problem with uh, data breach uh, uh, clearing houses. So, so the first thing, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, reply to um, some of Omri's uh, point, at least in the last part of his presentation, about uh, the assumptions. So maybe consumers are really, are they not receiving their desired privacy terms? Maybe this data, this uh, privacy paradox uh, problem can just be explained, as Omri said, by no, not by a lack of consumer interest, but maybe they're just getting what they want, uh, or there are no, not many concern in, in private harms. Um, um, but, not, but not really, maybe they're more focused on, on social harms as opposed to, uh, to the private ones. Alternatively, it could, the privacy paradox, this, this discrepancy between what consumers say they want and, and how they act, and I guess the say they want in surveys has a, 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 uh, another host of, of problems, but another reason why this might be the case is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding and a, and a, and a difficulty in ascertaining potential costs and harms, particularly when these are uh, an, of, of an unknown um, nature. So the existence of, of private harms and the associated market failures that might cause them is, is really an empirical question. Um, so, okay. So is privacy in this context, in the, pri in the private realm, um, a problem? And Alessandra Christie, who's here, who's done a lot of work in this, uh, in this area, um, he has an excellent uh, article where he shows that consumers have a hard time conceptualizing unknown harms and a series of experiments and studies uh, showing or providing some evidence and support for that particular problem. Not that they don't care, but it's just very hard to, to understand. And he analogizes to this idea of writing a, a blank check, you just don't know what, what the damage is going to be uh, by the end of it. But there's also some additional um, evidence on this. There's an article, for example, that consumers um, learn, and, and this also by uh, Alessandro, they, they learn their in, in Facebook, they track consumers, uh, actual Facebook users over time, and, and they find that once cons consumers learn about their environment and they learn how to, you know, the, the different privacy trade-offs and, and the potential harms and how to navigate this, uh, they, they take increasingly privacy protective actions. So there's some evidence that, there's, that, that conduct uh, reveals some, some privacy preferences. Um, also, there's a really interesting um, study by uh, Catherine uh, Tucker and co-author where they found that after the Snowden revelations, they used Google Trends data to show that when people are become aware that they're being watched, they censor themselves in the types of searches that they engage in. This is not a survey, uh, so it, it has uh, a, a bit more of a, a, a validation, so they, they, they're less likely to look for uh, medical uh, things are potentially embarrassing searches, even though these might be uh, these might be beneficial for them to know. They're just basically depriving themselves of of knowledge. So there's some evidence um, of this, and, and ton, also there's countless uh, of media attention to this. Um, if, if we assume that uh, newspapers and, and media are interested in captivating their their readers, you'd you'd assume that they want to focus on uh, on content that consumers. And, uh, and readers care about, and the, and the salient attention to privacy might be, uh, might be some example of this. So the What They Know series, another New York Times has this privacy project where every, every day there's a different um, article on this. Um, of course, there's also public harms, like Omri said. So examples like Cambridge Analytica and various uh, data security breaches show that privacy harms can also be very public. So right, the, uh, threatening democracy or, or making all sorts of uh, private information, financial information of vulnerable is another uh, public harm. Um, and these could be regulated as externalities in the way that Omri proposes in his uh, uh, extremely interesting article. Our focus here, though, is mostly on 
private harms. The uh, passport clearinghouse could, could address uh, uh, the private harm, that, that, uh, the public harm that Omri uh, talked about. So, so both approaches, so we don't think of it as an either or. It's not either a public harm or a private harm. They could both coexist. So regulation for public harms and default rules or anti-deception for manip manipulative uh, choice architecture can both coexist and they could address problems uh, in different uh, targeted ways. So, so that's the public versus uh, private. private. Uh, and then um, focusing now on the uh, disclosure and the stickiness and, and default rule approach that, that we talk about. So, um, so uh, Omri rightly points out, and Terrell rightly points out, that the, there's too much, too much burden imposed on consumers and uh, disclosure is highly unlikely to work. I, I too do research on disclosure and I too find that it doesn't work. Um, so our approach would ideally limit disclosures to only those terms where firms have significant interest in, in opting out. So just a very, because, it, because the opt out is so costly, just very few terms would, uh, uh, would be the ones where firms uh, op opt out of. Omri raises a really interesting point of uh, maybe this uh, opt out architecture would end up segregating people by patience and not by preference and this is something that we uh, need to think about. The, the trade off of that is that this particular choice preserves flexibility and it, so mandatory rules are great if you identify them well and you have a particular uh, uh, set up of, of, of consumers but what if there's heterogeneity there's, and, 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 and what if you don't really know what the rules are and what if the environment like, is so dynamic that needs to adapt to new scenarios and also new preferences. So when you have these conditions, you can't really take everything into account and you need to make some choices. And one is just to create some rigidity that, pres that preserves the benefits of the mandatory rules and that it relieves consumers uh, for, uh, uh, from some uh, choices, but it also allows for some flexibility uh, when regulators might not know what's, uh, what's best and when, and when uh, preferences are heterogeneous and, and also when the environments are, uh, are changing. So um, it also con uh, con provides continuous feedback by seeing what these opt-outs are. Uh, regulators and the market can also um, learn. And, um, so, and also reducing the number of terms can also increase the likelihood that they be may become salient to consumers. So we're now we're just not talking about the uh, ticket master dark, dark pattern where that you get sig uh, a, a, a sequence of, of, of choices that you need to make, but, but very few, ideally. How, how many? That, that's, a, that's a harder question that comes in a later slide. Um, so, but, right, can disclosure ever be meaningful, right? Omri said, you know, he'd be pointed out all of these disclosures that talk about meaningful and knowingly, and it just seems, it seems great in theory, completely unworkable, uh, in practice, because there's this aggregation, right? You have to agree, meaningfully agree to everything. And who has time to do that, right? So that would reduce the regime's uh, effectiveness. But that being said, pointed disclosures might work in specific, very specific contexts. And there's a little bit of uh, evidence. Uh, there's some evidence that, that, that might offer a little hope. So there's a, a, a very recent study that shows that uh, they, they, they were interested in the extent to which ad transparency might affect the effectiveness of the ads, and they found that it did, that when, when the ad um, does not reflect the expected information flows, when you know, it, it tracks you from some weird other, uh, from, from three sites ago, consumers feel a bit um, irritated by it, and, and they're less likely to purchase that product. That's not... That's the, the purpose of the study was to focus on ad effectiveness. I was mostly interested in, in the fact that the disclosure of the, of the purpose of the ad actually had an impact on behavior, meaning that the disclosure might have been uh, somewhat, uh, might have been absorbed by, uh, by consumers. Um, and then uh, Cass Sunstein has been working on uh, disclosures and choice architecture in which might play a role in this. And I know we, we have, there's some disagreements about whether this might uh, work or not, particularly when consumers are uninformed, which is, which is a, a big, uh, um, that, that, that should be at the center of the, of the design of uh, default rules. That being said, there's still plenty of mandatory rules. So there, as I said earlier, there are no default rules in the privacy context. So having something, even if it gets opted out of, can actually alleviate a lot of the problems that regulators face when trying to bring uh, actions against um, firms. 
um, dark patterns and relative uh, deceptive practices could be prohibited. Terrell rightly points out, um, and, and Omri does uh, as well, that, well, there, there's nothing new here, right? This is just a, you know, deceptive practices happen everywhere, and, um, and it's not just common to this environment. However, by identifying these particular practices, it could, it could help create uh, the, the type of attention that for example, post-transaction post marketing did a few years ago, and, and that resulted in a bill that basically eliminated it. And that, goes, that relates to the, Terrell's point about how to identify the harm. So post-transaction marketing happens when you, you check out of a known vendor, and then um, there is this uh, pop-up that comes up that says that if you click on this or if you put your email address, you're going to get 10% of your next purchase. You don't, you know, unbeknown to you, you're just basically subscribing to some kind of savings club, and then you know, by all, you're also agreeing to having the original, uh, the original firm transferring your uh, credit card information to this post-transaction vendor in a practice called Data Pass, and and then a few months later, you're just starting to get charged, and then. A Maybe a few years later, you realize that you've been getting this like $4.99 or $12.99 bill in your credit card, and you just don't know what it was. It was for a reward fund club that you just didn't know how great it was because you never accessed it. So what the FTC uh, did in those cases, and then eventually what uh, 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 Congress did, was just create uh, a, a law that prohibited that. And the harm was identified by, by identifying the, the very low take-up rate in these particular things. So if the, if the insurance concept if the insurance uh, uh, offered is, is, is never invoked at all, or, or if the product looks, uh, uh, looks extremely uh, fishy, this, this could help, for example, prohibit certain types of uh, dark patterns. So in that sense, it could be um, helpful. The data breach uh, clearinghouse could also address some uh, private um, harms. Um, and then we also talk about some implementation suggestions, this idea of a data-driven approach to identify, to identify uh, welfare-enhancing mandatory rules and default rules, of course, asking people in, in the abstract whether they want a, a rule is, is, is not very useful. This is this idea of, of trade-offs, and I know that Lior's uh, study has, has incorporated some of, uh, some of that, to what extent people are willing to uh, part with things. There's also some interesting research being done on that, the extent to which people are willing to pay for particular things. Um, uh, the same is true for opt-outs and, and tested for uh, effectiveness. And we also talked about dark patterns and clearing houses. Um, you know, of course, like all other recommendations, our approaches are not without challenges. And I know that's in the spirit of this uh, uh, conference. I know in earlier discussions with uh, Luigi said you have to identify the problems too, since it's part of the solution. So, so I'll do that now. So of course, correctly identifying which terms uh, should be mandatory is not without challenge, but it, it's not unsurmountable. There are mandatory rules in other uh, spaces. Um, and then there's the additional challenge, given that this is a highly dynamic environment, identify and update which are these uh, mutually uh, preferred terms. And, and then adopt, adopting the type of opt-out mechanisms that avoid the types of problems that Omri created. And also, it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about default rule architecture, we need to, usually when we think about um, uh, default rules in the context of a, in a, in a, a commercial context, there's, assumption, there's the assumption that both parties are, are informed. Here, uh, parties are, uh, the consumers are, are not informed. And so, um, in, in an excellent uh, recent article, Omri and uh, Oren uh, Bar Bargill uh, talk, uh, talk about and tackle this question about what happens when consumers are uninformed and how do you define and how do you create default rules when you might have some uninformed opt-out. So, that, so that's something that we would need to uh, take in, into account um, at all as well. And then finally, with dark patterns, in this case and, and in others, how to identify the threshold upon which choice framings become manipulative, and that relates to uh, Terrell's uh, uh, point. So conclusion, uh, we present an innovative approaches to address uh, important problems in the consumer uh, privacy uh, context that you know, they, they still need to be worked out. Uh, we, we do think that they have a potential to, to be helpful if ascertained and, and implemented um, correctly, this idea of identifying and implemented default rule, like, most specifically to fill in this contractual, uh, this, this uh, current silence, which is so problematic. This idea of creating pro-consumer bias for those terms of uh, whether there's preferences or expectations that might differ, this needs to be worked out uh, further.
uh, given all of the uh, problems and challenges I identified before, prohibit manipulative practice and address password vulnerabilities. Thank you so much and we look forward to your comments. Thank you. I'll do this very quickly, then I'll open to questions. So uh, I think first to Terrell and Lior. So can you convince and have well-informed consumers or is it a lost cause? What do you think? Oh, is that for me? Yeah. Um, is there any hope for that? Is, is it a lost cause? Yeah, oh, right. that's so depressing. <laughs> uh, um, well, look, I think what we've been discussing is the fact that privacy is a very important value in the digital economy and that having right-sizing uh, protections for privacy and regulations around privacy is really important, but uh, in and of itself is probably not adequate for all of the different um, potentially harmful scenarios that people need to navigate in a digital economy. So I think this kind of work is, is a helpful contribution to that. I also think um, deception, unfairness, consumer protection authority, very useful. Again, um, in and of itself probably not adequate um, and that continuing to scope some of the harms that we're talking about is really, really important, right? We need to have that inform the kind of protection that we need. At the end of the day, um, you know, I think this conversation fundamentally also comes down to a, a conversation about consumer trust. Right now we see um, unanticipated uses of data as uh, having badly frayed consumer trust in technology. When that trust is frayed, it actually affects demand potentially. We all ought to be very concerned about that from an innovation policy perspective because I think we want consumers to trust technology, adopt technology, use technology, create demand in the marketplace for technology so that we can get innovation and competition and all these other benefits. So I, I think that is also part of this conversation and, and a really um, important piece of it. You know. I, I think we have to, to get all of these things right. I think we will over time, and, and I'm an optimistic person. So yes, I think the answer okay. is we're making a lot of progress, and this is, uh, this is a helpful contribution to that discussion. Uh, Lior, how would you respond to Omri? Uh, I, well, this is really a response to your question, but maybe it'll work its, it work its way back to Omri and, and Terrell. You both made really helpful comments, and, and they'll improve the report greatly. Um, I don't think that trying to inform consumers is a lost cause. But I think it is usually not the best place for regulatory resources to be invested. Um, so I think uh, while I uh, basically persuaded by uh, Omri and Carl's book on mandated disclosure, I do think there's actually, I, I think I would put it a little bit differently. I would say um, informed consent typically doesn't, mandated disclosure typically doesn't do very much good, but there are contexts in which it can do some good. Um, and so there's a paper we both know by Manisha Padi in the, in the mortgage disclosure context that cuts against some of the earlier research. I'm a Bayesian, so that moves me a little bit, not a lot. I don't overreact to her paper, but I think it was really thoughtfully and, and smartly done. Um, but more generally, I think even in our own data, you can see that certain kinds of disclosures to consumers do move consumers even when we're talking about revealed preferences. So think back to our data and, show, and remember how much work just putting highly recommended after a choice did in terms of shifting people from no's to yeses. So there's certain kinds of infor information that will move consumers, and I think the really interesting empirical project is to try and disaggregate those kinds of strategies that fail from those kinds of strategies that succeed. The problem is that highly recommended is shifting consumers, it's not informing them. It's, uh, it turns out to be uh, manipulating them from our, uh, from our perspective. Um, and then I guess the, um, the I think the, the point that Omri made that's, um, uh, that's really interesting about, well, you know, paradoxically, are we kind of using dark patterns to manipulate consumers in a place where we think mandatory rules are not the right intervention? That's a great, that's a great point, I think. And I guess what I would say is the following. Um, again, some of our data about the, consu about the consumer backlash that results when aggressive dark patterns are used suggest that that consumer annoyance is real, and that that consumer annoyance in cases where firms are deciding that it's really important to extract a whole bunch of OKs from consumer will cause them to direct some of the hostility back at firms, which will erode firms' goodwill, and the fear of eroding some of that goodwill will in turn deter asking for permission, except when it's really, um, really, really important to the firm. 
and where they think they'll be able to persuade a lot of, a lot of consumers. So to me, the right mix is kind of an, a, a, a good mix of mandatory rules uh, these, um, uh, and these uh, uh, default terms that are, that are customizable, but only customizable at some cost to the, to the platform. Uh, Omri, a quick take, then I have time for mm -hmm. one question okay. to get from I the just want to uh, imagine the transaction that consumer enter, sits in front of and enters a website. And there are terms and conditions, including the privacy policy terms and conditions. And you've chosen to focus on the privacy issues and say they'll have the most important thing to them there, they'll have to show consumers to get attention. But I think the most important thing is probably not in the, you know, not just in the privacy uh, condition. And uh, they want you to agree to arbitration. They want you to disclaim all the warranties that the law otherwise gives you. They want you to agree to limitation on remedies. They want you to give up the intellectual property rights that you have in any content that you give. All of these things are critical, you know, as part of the business pattern. And the question is not how do you get them to peop get people to disclaim the privacy default, but think about the, the whole uh, landscape of default rules that are being disclaimed when people enter into transaction, and that was just one. Immediately thereafter, they went from ESPN.com to another to to another website to Twitter. They have to do it all over again. I just at some point you have to recognize showing people boxes and asking them to click is uh, you know is not going to work in regulating all of these things, um, and so it's uh, the result is you can't get people's consent for anything, and the effect is opting into, you know, through the back door into a mandatory regime in which firms cannot opt out of what otherwise was enacted as default rules. Now, I'm not against that, but that's conceptually what it, it ends up collapsing into. That's my concern. Just, just, a, just a quick quick response. I think that your concern would be uh, folded into our the point where we would consider different design features. So. One, one area where it's not so, uh, Terrell was talking about how she manages her default of privacy constantly. So a lot, a lot of the times the apps on the phone will ask you, do you want to share your, at the time in which you're about to invoke the app, and not every time do you want to uh, uh, be tracked uh, geolocationally even when the app is turned off. At, at the moment, you make the choice, you, you think about it, and after a while, I, I make informed choices, I, I learn what it means, and it's not so terrible. Now, being bombarded with, with, uh, with uh, click reps that you click on, click on, I agree, would be a terrible way of implementing this, and that's where the uh, data-driven and tested approach would come in, so that all of these problems would hopefully be addressed. Okay. I think I have time for one quick question, uh, Amat. Uh, one thing you didn't mention uh, in dark patterns that you you know one example is where you just can't finish the transaction without clicking through some of that. But there's a quick video about uh, signing off Amazon, which is really pretty shocking. Uh, it really is very difficult to sign off Amazon. So the website's very uh, complicated, and it's not obvious even how to get there. It's not under uh, my account or my thing. It's, it's actually amazing. You have to click ten things and then. You can't even close it yourself. You have to talk to them first, and then they can close it for you. So basically, it's a roach motel, come in and never come out. And uh, so some of these things are just so obvious, should be illegal. It's not possible that you would sign up to something and it would take you mm -hmm. a lot of annoyances to, to sign out. So in a few, there are low-hanging fruits in some of these cases, and I agree with you know, I think so. Anyway, so I, I think you might look around at the practices, and and just some stuff should be immediately illegal. My husband told me that LinkedIn, which we never signed up for, um, still uh, people think he has an account there because okay, so people share the email addresses. So very with quickly, them. what should be illegal and what should be left to the consumerian defaults? Um, you know, I'd really like if we could, if there were other questions too, maybe we can get two or three questions and then to answer no, them in lightning round, or are we out of time? Yeah, we're out of time. I mean, I th so I think what I would say is there, there are papers out there that try and look at, um, at dark patterns on some of the major platforms, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google. In Facebook, it often tends to be, will allow you, the dark pattern will, will allow you to protect your privacy, but you're going to have to go through a number of screens in order to get there. I think the Amazon example that you provided is a nice one. Um, really, th uh, these, are, these are what the report calls basically asymmetrically high transaction costs. Um, and in our view, the kind of work where we're trying to figure out what consumers would prefer in the abstract, uh, 
can help us inform things. Because if it turns out that if it's a, a choice that only 1% of consumers want to make or 2% of consumers want to make, then from our perspective, it's totally OK for Facebook to make you jump through four screens in order to get there. That makes a lot of business sense. If it's something that 80% of consumers would prefer, 80% of consumers would expect, then there's no good business rationale for making you jump through four different hoops or five different hoops in order to get there. OK. Well, thank you very much. And we'll continue the discussion in the next panel. Thank you.
Please take your seats. We're getting started. Thank you. Please take your seats. Okay, let, let's start. My, my name is uh, Ludwig Ziegler. I work with The Economist. Uh, I am with The Economist. I'm their US technology correspondent. Uh, and uh, yes, privacy is something I've written a lot about. Uh, though I have to say, after having written perhaps two dozen articles, I still am not sure whether I understand it. <laughs> so I hope this panel is going to help me. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a presentation by Alessandro. And I think your reputation precedes you. But before you start, I wanted to ask you, in, in, in one of the short bios I've read about you, it says that you are a motorcycle racer and a soundtrack composer. Let's well, explain that, and then you, you're allowed to give me But not at the same time. Uh, not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a musical about motorcycles and privacy, that could be a good combination of all the interests. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, the past tense is accurate here. I used to um, race motorcycles in the, in the United States, USGPRU not particularly successfully, so I guess it's good that I continue with my academic <laughs> career instead. But it was fun. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, and uh, good morning. I, I'm going to share with you some uh, um, uh, new results, um, which relate to uh, several of the, of the topics of this conference. The, uh, there is a platform angle, uh, certainly a privacy and consumer data angle, certainly an economics angle. Um, this work is unpublished, um, although we are going to present it more officially and in full form uh, um, in a couple of at a couple of conferences in June. And the, this work is part of a, a stream of uh, studies um, we have been trying to, to run uh, addressing this question. Uh, who really benefits from the data economy? This is a question that I've been uh, uh, grasping with and considering for quite a while, because if you look at the um, uh, most of the current uh, debate over privacy, uh, you find often claims such as uh, these ones, which I'm alighting on the, on the left side of your screen. Uh, privacy concerns do not have solid economic explanations. We, we kind of hinted at that as a, as a more than as a statement, as a question in, in the previous panel. Is there actual harm uh, for consumers at the individual, not societal level? Or in fact, uh, consumers, after they realize the benefits that they can also receive from sharing their data, uh, should feel uh, no longer concerned about uh, privacy invasions. Free online services would not be possible without increasing collection of consumer data. We need this increasing collection, an increasing, increasingly sophisticated collection in order <laughs> to sustain and foster uh, all the um, beautiful and free content and services that we have uh, become used to obtain from the internet every day. Uh, sharing personal data is in fact an economic win-win. Everyone benefits. Uh, in the case of targeted advertising, for instance, that's good for merchants who can target the right uh, uh, consumers. It's good for consumers who see a reduction in search cost. It's good for publishers who sell more valuable real estate online. And it's good for the data intermediaries who make money from, the, from these transactions. In fact, loss of privacy is the price to pay for the benefits of big data. We have to give up privacy to have all the uh, wealth uh, originated from machine learning and analytics. Now, I'm not trying to be controversial when I state that uh, there is a thin red line connecting all of these claims, uh, and it's, uh, none, of them, none of them is uh, demonstrated to be correct. Um, it may sound like an aggressive or bold statement. Uh, it's not because I'm trying to use my words carefully. I'm not saying that they are demonstrated false. I'm saying that there is little proof that they are 
generally correct. In fact, if you look at the literature, we can find evidence of still very open and very important questions, which I can uh, um, uh, contrast to each of these claims. Uh, privacy concerns don't have solid expo economic explanations. Well, in fact, uh, we know that under, even from traditional microeconomics, without even bringing into, into discussion behavior economics, which is uh, one of my fails, even just using traditional rational choice theor uh, theory, uh, there are several scenarios where consumers may want to rationally protect their privacy. Um, and there are also scenarios where uh, more privacy protection is beneficial in the ag aggregative sense, in, pa in Pareto uh, terms. But not always. So we still want to understand better under what conditions privacy will be welfare increasing, under what uh, conditions privacy will be welfare decreasing for individuals and for society as a whole. When do consumers benefit from trades in their data? Again, uh, it seems to be a claim that what we are enjoying now in terms of free content and free services, just to quote an example, I'm sticking to the, to the online uh, advertising, online publishing ecosystem example for, 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 for the sake of discussion. Uh, it seems that this, all these benefits are due precisely to the increasing collection of data. But in fact, uh, we know not enough about uh, the allocation of uh, value that is being extracted from consumers. To what extent? Uh, that collection is necessary to foster the services we use. Uh, correlation is not causation. And some of our work will indeed uh, be about this uh, very important issue. And I'm going to show you some results in a few slides. Who bears the cost of privacy enhancing technologies? We do have, and we have had for nearly 20 years, uh, technologies which, so to say, allow us to uh, have the cake and eat it too. Uh, from homomorphic encryption to anonymous credentials to differential privacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Name an electronic transaction which is being done today in non-privacy preserving manner. There is some technology to do it uh, in a more privacy preserving manner. Now, wearing back uh, my hat as an economist, not as a technologist, I do know that there is also no free lunch. Whenever you apply these technologies to data, you are degrading granularity and the value to some extent of the data. The interesting question as an economist is, if we are degrading that value by using privacy enhancing technologies, who is going to bear the cost ultimately? Is the consumer himself or herself? Is the society? Due to privacy enhancing technologies, we cannot find a cure for cancer because uh, medical researchers cannot bridge these data sets in a new fascinating way which finds something new and important in the data. Or, the protection through technology is actually simply eroding um, profit margins of data oligopoly. So there are essentially here uh, different claims that can be made. But to me, the, 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 the lesson is that although the discussion on the economics of privacy often focuses on uh, what is the harm. And in fact, uh, uh, last night, uh, Luigi's questions to one of the Luigi's questions to Chris Hugh was indeed, what is the harm? And that, that is a totally legitimate question to ask for economists. But I posit, I suggest actually, that there are equally important questions to ask, such as what is the benefits and how it is allocated. And if we start using different technologies, where will be the cost and what will be the change of the benefits? Okay? So kind of turning, turning the table and looking at the question in a different way. Uh, today, in particular, I will try to show you some early evidence from a study which tries to address this broader question. If economic surplus is being generated from data, and I do believe that it is, how is the surplus allocated? Who is extracted the surplus? And I will focus specifically in the case of uh, targeted advertising. I was mentioning earlier that the data industry likes to present targeted advertising as an economic win-win where everyone benefits. And I'm, going, I'm not going to repeat the rationale for why. What's interesting to me is that if you look at this issue of economic win-win in targeted advertising, just from the standpoint of theoretical microeconomics, or I.O. really, uh, you can uh, come up with very different frames. Um, under one frame, which is the one I believe the data industry uh, proposes, uh, there are consumers and publishers, and there are merchants. Merchants want to find consumers, consumers want to buy from merchants and uh, the ads appear on publisher sites uh, facilitating these, uh, uh, these transactions. 
and the data intermediaries, by virtue of the information they have about merchants, about consumers, about publishers, act as matchmakers. They provide a service to everyone because they reduce search costs from both sides. Everyone is better off under this frame. There is another possible frame. Again, we have consumers and publishers, we have merchants. Now, consumers have a finite, and they are the data intermediaries. Now, consumers have a finite budget and attention. They cannot look at all ads all day. And they also cannot buy all the things they see on ads continuously. Publishers compete for consumer attention. And because of the proliferation of platform, this competition has become really, really, really fierce. Merchants compete very aggressively with each other because now the competition is such that a merchant online producing and selling um, um, dressy shoes may be competing with a producer selling uh, fresh veggies and with a producer selling online uh, tickets. The competition is fierce. In the middle, I would argue, there is an oligopoly. I'm not dismissing the fact that the advertising ecosystem is extremely complex. It is. There are many, many players there. But essentially, there are a few players who are extremely powerful. They are the matchmakers and also the gatekeepers. So under this different frame, you would have different expectations about where surplus is going to converge, or at least where most of the surplus is going to converge. So. Um, the study I was hinting at, the one that I'm, uh, I'm going to show just in very uh, re reduced form, so to say, is uh, part of a pretty vast attempt we have been undertaking um, around studying empirically uh, the value allocation in the data economy. So we have several experiments going on, very time consuming, because it's uh, one of the paradoxes to me of the data economy is that it is so untransparent. It's very difficult to, to actually find data about what happens in the black box of targeted advertising, at least for third parties such as us, academic researchers. In this particular study, um, my screen just went off, but I guess you can still see. OK, wonderful. So you can still see. Uh, so in this particular study, what we did was to focus on uh, publishers, thank you, and uh, how much more do, thank you so much, do publishers receive, kind of what premium they receive when they sell advertising space which, um, which is behaviorally targeted versus when it is not, okay? Once again, we know that targeted advertising is uh, very valuable. We know that merchants pay a premium for that. And we know there has been much, of academic, much academic research on that, that targeted advertising is also more effective for merchants, increases click-through rates, okay, and conversion rates. There is debate on whether, there is an interesting debate on in, interpreting those metrics. I will not get there. The point here is that merchants do pay more. How much of that more goes to the publisher? So, again, theoretically, you can make two very different arguments. And, and you know what? They may be both simultaneously correct. Advertising willingness to pay increases when they can target their audience because that audience becomes more valuable. So advertisers, merchants, would pay more and publishers would get more. Or as uh, the targeted audience get, uh, shrinks, because the better you target, the smaller is the pool of people interested in the, the particular product, uh, then uh, we have a reduction in competition and uh, other price uh, decreases, the, the, the money spent by merchants and publisher revenue decreases. Or perhaps, there is something, a little bit of both going on at the same time, such as uh, the competition, reduced competition argument doesn't apply really because, like I said earlier, merchants could be bidding on the same person, but for different reasons, because this person may be interested in fresh veggies and in dressy shoes and in a flight uh, to uh, Brazil in a week. So maybe there is competition and advertisers pay a lot, uh, and yet publishers don't get that much. So, uh, we leverage a data set which was shared with us by a very large American conglomerate, the owner of many uh, different online websites. And we tried to estimate what was their delta, the margin, the increase in revenues, when in the visitors they received to their sites, there were cookies, which in fact could be used to behavior targeted ads versus they were not. So specifically we're focusing not on uh, targeting in general because Contextual targeting can still be done at the level of the page of the site. Uh, contextual, for instance, based on the topic of the page. But we're sp specifically focusing on behavioral targeting. The one which requires cookies, requires tracking information across different sites. Um, 
these data came from 60 different websites, uh, over 2 million transactions. We had uh, lots of data about this transaction, the characteristic of the ads, the URLs where the ads were shown, the advertiser's name, basically the merchants who were bidding for the, and, and we need a bid for the ads, as well as whether there was cookie information or not. And we were trying to see how much the, cook, the, the visitor with cooking uh, is, uh, is more value for the publisher versus no cookie. Uh, now, for those of you with an economic background, I'm pretty sure that you already are worried about something, or you should be, self-selection, right? Because uh, to some extent, the presence or the absence of a cookie may sometimes be due to the visitors on decision making. Not always, because in some cases it's the browser that makes a decision for the user. But in some cases the user may choose a browser for a certain reason, such as privacy protection, or may use cookie managers to remove the cookies. So we have a selection bias, right? Because maybe those users are also more or less valuable comparatively to other visitors. So we have to account for that. And this not being a randomized experiment, the only way we can account for that is this is observational data. We have to use uh, more sophisticated um, uh, econometrics, which is uh, the augmented diverse probability weighting approach. We basically estimate the probability the user will have a cookie or not, and then we estimate two different outcome models, one with, for transactions with cookies and one with trans for transactions without cookies. Then we compute the weighted means of the treatment-specific outcomes, and we compute the average treatment effect. There are nice uh, there is desirable properties of this augmented uh, um, uh, inverse weighting approach. And uh, long story short, what do we find? We find that there is an increase in revenues for the publisher. But the increase is pretty small in our data. And this was robust to all possible manipulation checks we could throw at the data is 4%. So yes, there is a premium. It's pretty small. Now, it is statistically significant. Is it economically significant? Well, um, it is at 0 0.00008 per ad, which is better than nothing, obviously, because if a publisher is selling uh, many ads, many transactions on a day, that's, uh, that's money. Uh, but it comes at the cost, uh, the infrastructure, uh, potential liability, uh, compliance cost. There is the concern for user privacy. But furthermore, and here I'm bringing back the discussion to the big picture, how much of what the merchants are paying to buy targeted ads end up being at the end of the funnel going to the publisher? That to me is the interesting question. Now our study cannot fully address it yet because we only see this part of the puzzle, right? So right now we can only use anecdotal evidence for the beginning of the funnel. And when we use it, anecdotal evidence, I'm quoting here from an article which was published very recently in the American Prospect, uh, in fact, about uh, one week ago or so, um, stating that an online advertisement without a third party cookie sells for just 2% of the cost of the same ad with the cookie. Now, basically, I'm asking you and myself to do kind of like a double negative here because th the way this sentence is phrased is saying that the, if there is no cookie, merchants are paying 2% uh, than what they pay when they actually buy ads which are going to be targeted with cookies, right? So the, the premium that the merchants are paying is very significant. The premium that the publishers are getting is 4%. 4, 4%. Now, big caveat, enormous caveat. Right now, this is an Apple and Origins comparison because this data here doesn't come from the same experiment we ran, right? So our next step, and if anyone in the data industry wants to prove <laughs> us wrong but wants to collaborate with us, is to triangulate, close their circle with an experiment where we play all the roles. We see the publisher, we see the merchant, and we can really triangulate the data. Right now, this is very interesting evidence. We want to close their circle. The second point I wanted to make, going back to this discussion of regulation, is that you hear often um, in the debate over privacy the threat the perceived threat, the regulation will kill, uh, what's the English expression, the golden uh, egg? Goose, thank you. <laughs> uh, you see this site, this citation comes from er about 12 years ago. I could have chosen something just for the last few bumps related to GDPR. That's possible that these claims are correct, but if, and I stress again if, if we are instead correct that publishers get 4% more from showing targeted ads than, untar than uh, uh, non-behaviorally targeted ones, then this, raise, this does raise the question of whether regulations such as GDPR would have such a catastrophic effects 
on downstream availability of free content and services as sometimes some representative of the data industry seem to suggest. And I will leave you with this uh, open question. Thank you. Thank, th thanks, Alessandro. Two quick questions. Do you, um, wh where, where did you get the data from? I mean, can, can you tell us a bit more on that? Because I find that very interesting. And the other thing is, uh, do, do you already have perhaps preliminary results that could tell us whether uh, actually uh, who's going to bear the brunt of, of, of GDPR or perhaps privacy enhancing technology? So, um, thank you. Uh, about the first question, the, the, uh, the data comes from an American media conglomerate um, which owns uh, over 60 websites. Uh, These websites include, although I cannot name the specific conglomerate, privacy or in this particular case, uh, NDA, <laughs> what I can discuss certainly is the fact that the websites cover both uh, very high traffic and uh, moderate uh, traffic, moderate to low, not low in the sense of 200 visitors per month, but low compared to, say, New York Times and Wall Street Journal. And they include sites which are, could be called uh, generalist, that cover many different topics, and sites which are um, specific to uh, certain audiences. And the results seem robust uh, across the board. Uh, in terms of GDPR, um, I feel that so much has been said about GDPR, but the, honest, the only honest, uh, honest answer I can give you is that no one really knows because um, it, the, 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 the implications, the ramifications of an initiative such as GDPR will only be felt through not just months, but a few years. So we are in need of uh, empirical work and full disclosure, I, as many others, are trying to do exactly that empirical work to, to understand what are the downstream implications of GDPR. For instance, uh, again, is it true that under GDPR we will observe a, a reduction in the quality and in the quantity of content that uh, EU websites make available to the world compared to US sites due specifically to the reduction in the abil their ability to, to collect and track, track information? We are running exactly that experiment, so we are monitoring the data. And uh, only once we know more, then I will feel more comfortable making economist hat uh, comments about GDPR. The only thing that short term I can say is that GDPR acted as a, as a huge catalyst for discussion about privacy because we see changes now in, uh, in, uh, in the public debate even in the United States and we see uh, a number of organizations such as Facebook and, and Google making claims about privacy. To some extent, those new claims and new stances may be due just to recent scandals. To some extent, they may be also potentially be due to GDPR and the threat of regulatory intervention in the United States that GDPR has also ended up causing. Thank you. Now to you, Dina. Um, you've been a um, technology entrepreneur and an um, advertising executive for 10 years. Now, now you've written a paper on the antitrust case about Facebook. And before you kind of give us uh, the rundown of that, tell me why you've written it. Why now? What, what was the motivation? Well, um, I was on the advertising side, the money side of all these markets. And I was watching how all digital advertising money, almost every incremental new dollar that enters the market, goes to Facebook and Google. And the stories and the fact patterns that I was watching seemed to me like classic antitrust fact patterns. and. Um, I think there's a lot of market risk and sort of black box risk with digital advertising markets. So I was also concerned about the industry from a macro perspective. And so I thought it might be a good, a good move to, to get out before any crash happens. And I just thought these were you know, terribly interesting questions that were going to be at the forefront of democracies across, across the world. Cool. So, um, Perhaps I'll just start by, by sort of narrowing the conversation of what's happening in these digital advertising markets. I think a lot of the, a lot of the antitrust fact patterns become very clear if you just follow the money and understand what's happening in digital ad markets. So when you go to a website and you load an ad, and by the way, we're, we're you know, we, we have this conversation about tech platforms, but if we, you know, tech platforms operate in different markets.
if we narrow the conversation to Facebook and Google, we're really just talking about the digital advertising market. Um, Facebook made, I think, about 98, 99% of its 55 billion in revenues in 2018 from digital advertising. So these you know, massive companies are just selling digital advertising. And if we now take a moment to look at how that market mechanism is working, these are mostly auction markets. So when you go to a website and you load a page in the milliseconds that it takes for the page to actually load, there are actually real-time auctions happening in the background where a decision is being made as to which ad should we show this person in this geolocation that is loading a page about, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a BMW review on the automotive section of the Wall Street Journal, right? So these are auctions that are happening. There are many different exchanges because auctions are run through exchanges that are run in the digital advertising markets. And um, these are not all independent exchanges. So you have some exchanges, but Google and Facebook are operating their own exchanges. This is important to realize because at least you know with Facebook, for example, these are black box exchanges. They're running the auction rules. They're running the pricing rules. They're running the clearing price rules. They're running transparency rules or importantly, the lack of transparency and the lack of audit rules in these markets. And Facebook has not gone through a recession yet. And I wish I had the opportunity to, re to reply to, to Cohen yesterday, but, but you know, I've spoken to small businesses across America that have lost money buying Facebook ads because they buy ads and there is literally no way to audit whether Facebook is delivering what they say they're delivering. You can measure sales, but you cannot actually measure whether um, you're getting the impressions. You cannot measure whether they're serving the advertising, and you cannot measure whether they're serving it to humans or bots. So controlling the auction mechanism is, is a reflection of not only market risk, but it's a reflection of monopoly power, right? So the Yellow Pages in the early 2000s was a monopoly and you know there's two ways that a company with monopoly power can increase price in the digital advertising world they can either increase the side of the equation where it's the transparent price but advertising is sold price per circulation so you can increase price or you can fudge on circulation or reduce audits on circulation and I'm not just you know I mean this is this is significant there's always like human actor risk when you have black box environments, right? And um, recently, Nelson Peltz took a board seat at Procter & Gamble, and the CMO at Procter & Gamble was under tremendous pressure to make sure that they're spending money wisely. And he took the stage and he put tremendous pressure on Facebook to open up to audits of their circulation numbers. And um, Facebook did, and weeks before some, the auditors came out with numbers, Facebook admitted that for the last two years they had been inflating video circulation metrics. You know? so, so we have a lot of empirical evidence on the advertising side of the market of these types of behavioral fact patterns. And if you go to advertising events, you have industry people on the advertising side of the market that are taking the stage complaining about Facebook's monopoly power in the digital advertising side of the market. They don't know what monopoly means, but they just know that their behavior in terms of audits is just an outlier. So, um, but, but let's go back to how these auctions work. So the, the inputs to clearing prices to these auctions are your user identity and your user data. Those are inputs into the auction model. They determine outcome pricing. So let, let me explain how this works. If you go to the Wall Street Journal and you read an automotive article or you, you, know, you read lots of articles about you know, these nice cars, the Wall Street Journal as a publisher can put you, if they know your identity, so the Wall Street Journal, you know, you're logged in, but, if they know, but for other publishers, they might not know your identity, so they're reliant only on you know, random um, variables that users can delete if they delete their cookies. But, um, they can put you into a, a bucket and they might call you an automotive intender. 
So you're somebody that is in the market looking for an automobile. The value now of an impression to show you has skyrocketed maybe from a, um, you know, a $10 CPM to a $150 cost per thousand, right? So the value of that ad to you just skyrocketed. And that's because they know what you read, right? Okay. So now let's imagine um, the Wall Street Journal goes to the New York Times and says, hey, can we put code on your site that will inform us what readers on your site are reading? Is that rational behavior? Would the New York Times or any publisher let a competitor in digital advertising markets do that? And the answer is, of course not, right? Like that's their audience. If you let the Wall Street Journal know what New York Times readers are reading, when that anonymous user comes to the Wall Street Journal, they can now um, sell them an advertising at an automotive and tender price because they know the user was reading an auto article in the New York Times. Like that would never happen. They are direct competitors in advertising markets. So why is it in digital advertising markets, you know, Facebook and Google are also direct competitors? in advertising markets. So why is it that every publisher in America lets Google and Facebook monitor, track, and record what their audience is doing? And then, as part of the permission terms of these agreements, use that data to turn around and price undercut publishers in digital advertising markets. Because that is exactly what's happening, and that is exactly why money is going to only Facebook and Google why they're able to sell the lowest cost advertising. They don't have to pay writers. They do not have to create content. And, um, and you know, so from, from, the, from the money side of the business, I just thought that these fact patterns were terribly interesting. And the answers really are because Google has monopoly power in uh, the, the, the ad server market, and Facebook has monopoly power as a social network, and they are able to demand the terms that they want. It's not pricing, but you know, if we want to, we, we you know, we we really need to understand the the crossover between data and antitrust because the data, the user data that these companies extract from a permissions perspective, um, are an asset. They're traded on exchanges. You have data exchanges that just trade user data. They have tremendous asset and book value. So we can pretend all we want that like the terms that they're extracting from, it would be like, you know, it would be like Standard Oil negotiating extraction of oil terms from land, but then sitting around and saying, well, you know, that's an extraction problem. That's not an antitrust problem. If like, you know, it just skyrockets, like it's worth, you know, it's the new sort of the oil or the new, the new gold, but that's, you know, that's, that's exactly what's happening, so. Thank you, thank you, Dean Evans. Uh, I mean, I found your, your paper quite interesting because it gives a, an interesting narrative of how Facebook got to where it is now. And I no, don't necessarily agree with it in all points, but it was an interesting narrative and was new to me. Could you kind of quickly walk us through how, how you see kind of the history of Facebook and how it became this monopoly, as you say. Sure. So um, I think that, you know, the papers, so I, you know, on the, on the money side of the market, you know, what's happening in terms of why every incremental advertising dollar is going to, to Facebook and Google is, be, is because they're extracting these permissions across the horizontal market, across competitors, to be able to track users, um, to track, to basically extract data from users as they move you know, through the through competitive properties on the publishing side, and so and so I thought, well, consumers can't like this in a democracy, right? So I mean, do, does anybody in this room today, if you sign up for Facebook, one of the terms is that Facebook is going to monitor what you read and record, what you particularly, and they're tying it to your identity at the social security number, like you can't break, you know, the identity match. Um, on over 8 million websites and mobile applications, what you read, what you um, type into mobile applications, if you're typing health data, um, what you watch, what you look at, what you research, does, does anybody in this room like that part of the exchange with Facebook today? 
Right. So, I mean, I think this is the, you know, it's not even like we don't need to prove sort of the good or the bad behind the data or the privacy stuff that's happening. Like we have, we have, this is the consumer preference, right? Like you guys can vote, you guys can choose what you want and what you don't want. And here the market's history with Facebook is really interesting because when Facebook entered the market and it had competitors to compete with, it was all about not tracking users after they left Facebook. I mean, they specifically promised, we will not use cookies to track you after you leave Facebook full stop, right? And so this, is, this was in 2004, it was competing with MySpace, it was competing with you know, lots of other social networks. And in 2007, it, um, you know, anybody on the advertising side knows that this is the, the, this is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you can accomplish this behavior, Right, your margins just skyrocket. So, and you have this incredible barrier to entry. Um, so in 2007, it tried to do this, right? So we have like this a tremendous amount of empirical, just market, net market history. Like we can just look at the market history. So in 2007, it, it tried to do this. It tried to start tracking users on third party sites and consumers were Outrage. They protested. They, you know, form, formulated groups. They um, started privacy movements. They led protests, and Facebook backed down, retreated, and the CEO of the IAB, Randall Rothenberg, said, "I mean, look, free markets are working. We don't need regulation, right?" So the IAB used the moment to say, "We don't need regulation." Um, so, and, and Facebook, you know, apologized and Zuckerberg called it a mistake and, you know, this terribly, you know, sorry. And so in 2010 and 2011, Facebook introduced um, sort of derivative Facebook products for other websites to use. And these products were like the Facebook login, the like button. The problem is, is any time the way that these digital products work is anytime a, a publisher or a third party puts a piece of Facebook code on their website, right? Facebook can change the way that works anytime it wants. So there was this huge conversation and huge debate, not only between Facebook and publishers, but also between Facebook and consumers. And they were like, hold up a second. You just did this in 2007. You entered the market promising we're, you're not going to do this. We are all choosing Facebook, which is a market that's going to tip to sort of one player, upon the understanding that you're not going to do this. But this looks kind of suspicious because we're going to be giving you the power to now change it whenever you want, right? And so Facebook went on this incredible campaign explaining that these widgets and these like buttons and these you know, the Facebook logins and all these products that they were putting on across the internet were not going to be used for this purpose. We're not, you know, that we're not functioning for this purpose and that, you know, they were, um, you know, they would only pick up what you're reading if you happen to click on the like button, but not if you're not clicking on it, right? So, uh, and it perpetuated this for years because there was a lot of media coverage and, and you know, publications that were holding Facebook to, an, to account. So uh, Google, this, this might be kind of strange for us to imagine today, but Facebook, you know, internally, and we know this from some of the confessions of former executives that have written books, was terribly concerned about Google's efforts competing with Facebook in the social network market. So in June of 2014, Google announced it would pull its social network Orca. And coincidentally, in June of 2014, after 10 years of examples of a competitive market restraining Facebook's ability to now conduct horizontal surveillance of users, same month, Facebook announces it will now implement horizontal surveillance. And so all those codes that were on publisher sites were, you know, a sort of Trojan horse. And they now, you know, changed the permissions, changed the way that they were going to work on the back end, um, changed the use permissions, specifically that they could now use the data to price undercut publishers and advertising markets.
And you know, nobody has any option. Publishers don't have an option. Their revenues are taking a hit. Users don't have an option. The market is consolidated to this, to this winner, you know, take all outcome. And so thanks, Dina. So uh, I'll, I'm going to ask the, the other two panelists now to react to what they've just heard, both from Dina and from Alessandro. Let's start with you, Ashkan. Um, great. Uh, first off, I want to thank you uh, guys for having me. This is kind of my some. I think uh, my favorite people in this space, so it's kind of great to be on a panel. Um, just a bit of a background, so I, I'm a technologist. I work as a reporter, as a policymaker. Um, I worked at the FTC on both the Google and Facebook and Twitter investigations in 2011, and then I now advise a number of policymakers on policy in this area, most recently um, helping to write the California privacy law, which I'll talk about, I think, in this context. Um, uh, I will say, you know, if you haven't read, so, so I've been excited about the, uh, Alessandro's paper for a while, and then if you haven't read Dina's paper, um, for an e kind of econ-ish pa privacy paper, it kind of reads like a, uh, you know, a detective novel, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's kind of like a storytelling with really good quotes about from the executives, and it reads really well, so I, I, I kind of urge you all to read that story because I think it's a strong story, and I think <laughs> it speaks to not only the market power, but the kind of the technological nuance of this stuff. The, you know, the um, role of the company, both in terms of what it's publicly said, as well as some of the internal documents of folks have had a chance to read the leaked documents from this San Mateo 643 case, describing kind of internal communications by kind of leadership and, and product folks at the company around some of these decisions, uh, you know, some of the terms like reciprocity, if folks are familiar with the, with, um, the reciprocity policy requiring that folks that use the Facebook API for the purpose of getting access to friend graph, the social graph and user's profile information, um, uh, be required to essentially feed back information they collect to Facebook, right? So this is this idea that like if you're an app that collects, you know, uh, uh, collects information from the user, Facebook should also get information, that same information, uh, as part of the agreement. Um, that's explicitly discussed in, in those in those leaked documents. Additionally, um, there's conversations around uh, um, excluding like exclusionary tactics for certain players like Vine, and so there's a there's a there's a um, reference there where uh, I think Zuck specifically says to block Vine from the API with no reason given other than that they're a competitor to Facebook video. And what's interesting about that, the way I like to think about that behavior is the key asset there that Facebook is providing is access to not only the user's personal information, but really the friend graph, which provides essentially virality. So if you're a startup and you're in the growth phase and you want to essentially grow a product, you can spend a certain amount of money on advertising in order to get people to see and learn about your product and then convert and download and install your product. Um, you can spend that money or you can use things like the social graph such that when I use the product, I then broadcast that use to my friends and my friends then are exposed to it and increases their likelihood. And the amount of essentially influence I think that Facebook can extract by selectively allowing access or excluding access to competitors to this resource, I think, can be framed in kind of economic terms. So I think thinking about those, those behaviors vis-a-vis -vis Facebook and, and Google, I think it's a really um, key, key way to think about this stuff. Um, briefly, is it worth me talking about the CCPA and how it works and how it kind of, I let's, think... Let's do that next. later like okay. in one of yeah. the other rounds. Paul, oh, what's, 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 what's your take? I mean, since uh, Ashken has talked mostly about Facebook, yeah, let me, let me say a little bit about Alessandro's amazingly interesting study. Um, I was nervous when you outed Alessandro for his motorcycle racing ha uh, history because in high school I rode a Honda Elite 80cc and I thought you were going to show a photo of it. It was, <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing and I flipped it one day and it broke. But at any rate, um, that's the closest I've ever come to a motorcycle. Um, so I'm a law professor, uh, not a very good one, but I'm a computer programmer as well and I'm a much better computer programmer than I am legal scholar. Um, I'm avowedly, though, not an economist, and I kind of consider it my cross to bear to walk into rooms of economists and tell them that they're doing privacy wrong. Um, and so that'll be my goal for, you know, six or seven minutes, but I want to get to the Q&A. Um, so, so I think I, I, I have a long kind of litany bill of particulars I can lodge against law and economics and the way it's infected kind of privacy discourse. 
Uh, but let me, let me bore down on, the, on two of the results we heard today because I think they do, in some fundamental ways, begin to strike at kind of core tenets, articles of faith that economists tend to bring to these debates. Uh, now, I don't think we've, we've kind of put those to rest, but man, the, the uh, evidence we've seen today is interesting. So let's start with uh, Lior's study and, and um, Jamie's study about dark patterns. I've been uh, going around as often as I can this year saying this is the year of the dark pattern. This mm -hmm. is the year where people like Senator Warner now have a bill that uh, uh, seeks to address dark patterns. I'll be speaking to his staff uh, at a public event next week about dark patterns. Jonathan Mayer at Princeton is doing some research, I think comparable to uh, the results we saw today. Um, and in a really interesting way, they really do strike at kind of the heart of what you heard echoed many times on the previous panel, the so-called privacy paradox. This idea that our revealed preferences betray what we really think about privacy. Uh, therefore, we should discount all the surveys and political strum and drong we hear about the desire in a kind of general sense for privacy. And uh, the quip I like to say is that there's a privacy paradox paradox, which is why economists think the privacy paradox is interesting or something that we should be debating. Um, but the only response we've had for many years is that it has to do with kind of, you know, the lessons of behavioral economics and nudges and the idea that here you have the masters of information, people who uh, have made their entire lives in Silicon Valley manipulating choices using kind of tools that heretofore have never been seen in human history to control what people do uh, in a kind of communications environment. And so, of course, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, they reveal their preferences by doing things against what would otherwise be their interests. And so I think dark patterns to me, the reason it's such a, so it's not a new idea, but it's a really useful salient label that gives us something to use to debate with the economists, right? The idea that the kind of sleazy tactics that Lior demonstrated are not just sleazy, but also highly effective. Uh, and this is like two pencil-necked economists, I mean, you know, uh, researchers probably with Qualtrics in a really ugly environment, um, still getting people to change their behavior significantly. So that's a kind of, you know, I think not mortal blow against the privacy paradox, but God, I hope we can talk about the privacy paradox a lot less uh, now that we have this useful shorthand. Number two, though, uh, is one that uh, I've already told Alessandro I owe a great debt to him because I've been asking this question for many years. I spent one year at the FTC as a senior policy advisor, uh, and while I was at the commission, as you all know, the FTC has a huge bureau of economics, so there's, it's, the place is lousy with economists, and so every time I would get an economist in my office, I would say, what's the proof that behavioral uh, econ uh, advertising is worth the candle? That this is you know, bringing something useful, especially to the publishers, but even to the marketers. Uh, and they would always cite to me kind of four or five empirical studies that if you closed one eye and looked at it sideways, maybe began to suggest that behavioral economics was a significant boon over contextual advertising. Uh, by and large, these were funded by industry because the only way to do this research is to get data from industry. Now, Alessandro has gotten data from industry as well, but come to the opposite conclusion. The principal researchers, and granted, this is 2012. I think there's been a lot of work since then. The principal researchers, I noticed, had a penchant not to list these studies in the academic research part of their CVs. It was always in the other work part of their CVs or consulting part of their CVs. Uh, and so we took it as an article of faith at the commission that you, know, you would hear from people like John Leibowitz and Edith Ramirez, people who were real believers that privacy was something that the FTC ought to take seriously and enforce. Uh, and yet they couldn't help themselves but to say in every speech about it, well, of course, we acknowledge that there's a lot of value being created here, but here's why we ought to protect privacy um, anyway. So I think Alessandro's really, really, really interesting result uh, is the one that I've always kind of believed in intuitively, and I'm glad to see that there's now some rigor being brought to bear on it. Uh, Four percent. I guess it, maybe in Q&A we can debate whether 4% is significant enough uh, to justify the kind of significant harms to privacy uh, and I'm happy to talk a lot about what those significant harms are because I think they've been giving kind of a narrow and short shrift today uh, in some of the, some of the conversations, right? Um, but to me, 4% really doesn't seem that interesting. 4% seems like something that might be an acceptable cost if what we're talking about is a way to protect a lot of human interests that matter a lot. Um, but rather than kind of drone on and on, let me just kind of give you my take on things. Uh, if I'm not gonna look at this through an economic lens, what am I gonna do? I'm actually gonna uh, advocate for something uh, that isn't new in American privacy policy. So there was a day when we passed privacy laws without kind of uh, 
incessant debates over what this will do to innovation. Uh, and instead, we kind of would rest our debates on things like human rights, uh, on democracy, on deliberative discourse. So we have something called the Wiretap Act. The Wiretap Act makes it a five-year felony. You'll go to prison for up to five years if you acquire the contents of someone's spoken conversations through telephone, through a hidden bug in the room. Um, it is a draconian and expansive bill. Um, it is a law. It is a law that is aggressively enforced, and I know this because I was a computer crime prosecutor at the Justice Department early in my career, and one of the things I did on the beat was I prosecuted wiretappers. Um, it affects all of the kind of quote unquote online innovation that you see. The innovation in our current economic environment exists uh, in spite of the Wiretap Act. And the Wiretap Act does mean that on the margins it's harder to build something like the Amazon Alexa because you've got to believe that when Amazon was first posting, uh, proposing something like that, one of their lawyers wrote a long memo that said, okay, here's how we're going to avoid going to prison for five years. Uh, yet innovate we did. Um, and so we write these kind of broad sweeping uh, laws that are not kind of scalpels that try and maximize all the innovation possible while, while uh, preserving a tiny bit of privacy. We take a meat cleaver out instead and we hack a line in the sand and we say, sorry about the mixed metaphor there, we say here is where we are going to separate X from Y. Here's where we're going to make it difficult for information uh, to cross a particular context. We've done this again and again. We did it in HIPAA, we did it in FERPA, we did it in COPPA. I'm willing to uh, defend all of those sometimes unpopular laws. And I think there are still gaps in that approach. Uh, and so for example, we don't have a right to location privacy law in this country. It's crazy. It really is crazy when you consider uh, the real harms that befall people uh, and there are kind of a litany of stories I can tell you about the harms from someone knowing your precise location that you did not want to know. Uh, we don't have a right to biometric privacy. The center I'm affiliated with, uh, um, the, the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown, did yet another landmark study today, I had no part of it, uh, about facial recognition and the way it's used by law enforcement. If you haven't seen the study, I urge you to look at it. Woody Harrelson uh, figures prominently in one of the results. Right. Um, so at any rate, that's a law we ought to have. And so although I appreciate, and we'll get into this in Q&A, the attention focused on the GDPR and the CCPA and Oshkan's work on that, uh, law. I also think there's room for old-fashioned sectoral privacy law, uh, but it's only going to work if we can shuttle the economists out of the room before we write it. Thanks. Mic drop. So you as a non-economist, yes. how, how do you explain the uh, targeting paradox? The privacy paradox? The targeting paradox. Which if is? it's not worth much, why are people doing it? I think that uh, Alessandro's already explained that, right? And so I'll try and play an economist if you'd like me to. I mean, there's an economic answer to it, which is, and I believe this at the FTC as well, although not official FTC policy, you have this oligopoly of snake oil salesmen. They call themselves the ad industry. Um, and the ad industry has convinced both of the sides of that market, that two-sided market, the people buying ads and the people placing ads, that they are creating value. And if you've ever seen the famous kind of growing taxonomy of the players in the ad targeting market. These are companies that exist for a hot second and then disappear. Um, they are masters at convincing both sides that play into technological insecurity, information asymmetry, um, that what they're selling is a valuable product. And they protect the information so we can't study it in the way Alessandro has. Uh, and so my like, creeping suspicion at the time was, this is a complete waste of money that is going toward nothing but like buying yachts for ad executives and or not even ad executives I, I could sleep better if that was it ad network executives uh, and I think we're going to see over the years that, that part of that story is true I'm sure it's not true exactly in the stark terms I just described it but I bet a lot of that story is true. Alessandro your explanation of the targeting paradox. Um, we have uh, perhaps not as a uh, um, uh, strong language, <laughs> uh, I, I, I find it a, um, an interesting empirical question because what we are showing is uh, at the end of the funnel, um, there is, uh, at least in our data, yeah. uh, very small, uh, very, very little that eventually makes its way to the publishers. But we also know from at the end of the data that there is uh, a significant premium that merchants are paying for the type of ad. So something, if we believe this data, these results, and if temporarily accept the, the premise of, uh, um, of the uh, I just made, of merchants paying much more for target ads than untarget be uh, behaviorally untargeted ones, then clearly something is remaining in the middle. The next step, which is the one that I really would like to address, is where exactly in the middle. 
because uh, the advertising ecosystem is quite complex and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's also a black box, as I was mentioned earlier. So I, I, I repeat my, I wouldn't call it a challenge, it's really a request or invitation. If anyone from the data industry wants to prove, prove us wrong, come forward, share data with us, let's do a study where we can really follow how one dollar spent here uh, ends up uh, reducing, going to you know the surplus of these different uh, intermediaries, and eventually reaches the publisher. Mm. Then we can have uh, <coughs> we can uh, finally answer your question. Yeah. And Dina, what's what's your take? I mean, do, do you also think that this entire ad tech industry, and if you've worked in it, is is a complete waste? It's not. Well, I mean, um, which part were you in? I don't you even know, know where you are. I, I worked for WPP. I don't know what that Facebook's is. Facebook's largest buyer. Okay. Yeah. They were the big. I'm sorry, they're, they're the largest ad holding company, okay. ad agency. So um, I'll just say two things. First, look, Facebook went public in 2012. They have not gone through a recession. 100% of the revenues that Facebook went public on do not exist today because they've rolled over their product. So we do have this problem in the industry of, you know, you know, they had this product, they went public, they had all these revenues. Oh my gosh, it doesn't work. We need to roll it over into something that we now tell our customers does work. And so you, you do have this, it's a legitimate, legitimate concern. I mean, also like all the big data in the world didn't predict that Trump was gonna get elected, so what, right? Um, yeah, the other thing is that, um, what was I gonna say? Facebook bit, targeting bit, that's about it, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, as, as, since you, I mean, we're kind of talking about Facebook. So, so I went to the Facebook developer conference a couple of weeks ago, F8, mm -hmm. and as you've probably all heard, kind of the, the, the big deal was the, the uh, Zuckerberg telling us the future is, is private, which I found kind of interesting after having told us a couple of years ago that the uh, future as we know it, no, uh, privacy as we know it no longer exists. So, uh, uh, Ashkan, t tell me, what do you make of this pivot to privacy? I mean, is, is, is there something really go real going I think on? Is that's a great question. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of, uh, just to an answer the earlier question as well, you know, I think of, I think it's important to, 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 to separate contextual and behavioral advertising. Um, but I do agree with Paul that essentially behavioral advertising is essentially like, you know, the blockchain without the cryptography, <laughs> right? It's like a, it's like a it's like a speculative market that everyone thinks is going to you know yield this huge result, and, and we don't know. Um, the interesting thing, so so Facebook's pivot to privacy, and you know, I I, I have a lot of kind of beliefs on why that pivot exists, um, but uh, one of which is is you know any in in, in California any kind of uh, Silicon Valley exec that goes goes to China and comes back suddenly decides they need to create WeChat. WeChat and Kakao Talk and all these kind of chat products are essentially the largest growing market um, in Asia, and this is something that I think Facebook has said publicly. And so it's kind of like you know the scene where where the guy's like, I think I'm taking crazy pills. It's it's fun watching the F8 keynote around privacy. The immediate keynote developed at the F8 conference, the immediate uh, talk following, which is also public, is the um, head of marketing, sorry, head, head of messenger product that goes through, uh, I don't know if you've watched that talk, but um, she goes through and talks about all the features that Messenger will provide to businesses, right? And so the kind of this guise of the pivot to privacy, which I think speaks to Dina's paper, Facebook has announced that they're going to encrypt, similar to what WhatsApp does, end-to-end -end encrypt messages between consumers, and that's their pivot to privacy. And, and a lot of folks are re reading that as they're going to encrypt the entire platform and consumers are going to have privacy uh, from kind of from on their news feed. Um, my understanding is it's not that, at least uh, based on the developer conference. What they're doing is essentially um, encrypting messages so that when Paul and I speak on the platform through a messenger product, um, those messages are encrypted end to end. Um, there will still be some filtering and uh, kind of um, ways to uh, detect problematic content on the endpoints. And there's a talk, there's another talk at F8 that describes what kind of what um, signature-based uh, techniques they might use on the end and, and machine learning techniques they might uh, uh, use at the end. But the thing that I think is missing from every the debate is that um, 
right now, if today, if you open your browser and you uh, or your you know your um, your uh, phone your Facebook app and you connect to say Facebook.com/united, which is the United Airlines page, or any business page on Facebook. Um, what ends up happening is you're immediately put into a chat with that business. So a uh, business pops up and says, hey, oh, some of them are automated chats where the business will pop up and start talking to you. Some of them, just the chat window is open and you can do things like get flight status or interact with the business. Um, announced at F8 is that you'll also be able to do things like shop and have a marketplace with the business and actually interact and do commerce using uh, what Facebook is going to provide a payment rail, a payment system as well to do commerce for, for businesses. And what's interesting about that is that's actually way more privacy invasive than exists today, right? So right now if you visited the um, United page on Facebook, they would get aggregate analytics about their visitors, like the age of the visitors, but only, they don't get specific IDs. Similar if you visited the United website, they get things like your cookie ID and your location, but if you've never visited the website before and you don't have a login, they don't get any specific information about who you are. Now, moving <coughs> forward uh, with this pivot to privacy, when you, vi when you visit a business's page and it's chat dialogue uh, pops up, the company receives your public profile information, which is your name, city, age, picture, right? which is actually more information that they would have received previously without that chat. And more importantly, Facebook has no uh, responsibility or, or ability to moderate the content that the business makes, the representations the business makes to, to consumers. And for example, at the FTC, a lot of the things that we were interested in were things like when companies make deceptive statements to consumers, showing nutraceutical ads, showing uh, you know, problematic um, paleo and lending, and, and those types of representations. And that they've essentially cut off that ability or, or that need to do quality control on what businesses say to consumers while simultaneously giving uh, more insights about the consumers that visit the business to the business uh, and, and doing it under this privacy pivot. So I think it's kind, of, it's kind of a really smart move. And it's all done in a first party context in the sense that I'm conf when I interact with Paul or when I'm interacting with United Airlines, to me, as, as a consumer, I'm interacting with the first party, which is Facebook, and the, under GDPR and under um, the California law, there's some kind of, I think there will be some clever interpretations on whether consumers know they're interacting with a third party business or not, or if they're interacting with a, a, you know, a United Airlines chatbot, right? Um, if I can um, um, expand on, 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 I believe, a very important point Ashka made and, and connected to uh, something Florencia was uh, saying in, in the previous panel when she was very kindly referring to some research we did in, uh, with Stutzman in around 2013 or so. Uh, the title of that particular paper, which was a study of uh, public disclosures on Facebook, was uh, Silent Listeners. Uh, so basically, we, we, we were trying, the, the reason why we ended up with the title was the following. We were studying how public disclosures on Facebook evolved from 2005 until about 2011. And, and we found that uh, people, indeed, over time, were taking more and more steps to protect their information. They were decreasing less and less publicly. So they were u making use of privacy settings. However, over the same period of time, uh, the amount of disclosure that over overall they were making, and sensitive disclosure in particular, increased uh, enormously. Because in 2005, Facebook consisted just of a few static fields, hometown, uh, interest, uh, and so forth. By 2011, there were all these third-party apps collecting data, many more fields, many more ways for which uh, um, users of Facebook could disclose information. This is an example, and I'm not claiming that this was intentional, because I'm, I'm interested in, in the downstream behavior analysis. This is an example of a somewhat of a misdirection, or, or a dark pattern, if we want to use the modern language. We, we, were, we were not using the term at the time, but it's a misdirection in that uh, I can give you privacy settings so that uh, your uncle will uh, not see this particular photo, or your grandmother will not see your status update, or your employer will not see this particular piece of information uh, that you have posted. But in doing so, I'm channeling your attention on your grandmother, your uncle, your, your, your employer, and I'm uh, putting into the background the fact that I, Facebook, keep monitoring all this information and keep collecting it. It's a very effective misdirection. Again, I'm not saying that it's intentional, but it works because people are trying to protect their privacy, but in fact, they are disclosing more and more sensitive information to third parties. 
which brings up uh, the point related to the privacy pivot. Only time will tell whether it's, uh, it's a real pivot and it's uh, truly honest and, uh, and genuine, or whether, again, intentionally or unintentionally, I have no, no, no comment, no, no view on that, we end up putting the attention only on certain things which can be protected, such as the end-to-end -end encryption of messages, and possible. reduce the attention on all the other data collection that is happening, which Ashkan was referring to. Yeah. And can I say one Sorry. thing? So, so <laughs> I think, okay, so if we actually explain what's going on, and we take the WhatsApp example, right? Because when Facebook talks about privacy, it's talking about the encryption of the communication between node A and node B, right? But the metadata around that communication right. is not private. And it is not making that data private. So let me, let me explain what this actually means, right? So if you use WhatsApp, encrypted end-to-end -end communication, Facebook's privacy pivot, pivot, right? And you make communications w with WhatsApp. I think um, a news publication e e explained this in sort of a, a very clear way a number of years ago. But they said, OK, so what that means is Facebook knows that you're standing on the Golden Gate Bridge and you have just called your doctor. They know that that conversation left, lasted two minutes. They know that you then called your psychiatrist. They know that that conversation lasted one and a half minutes and then you called a suicide hotline and that conversation lasted 60 minutes. So that is Facebook's definition of end-to-end -end encryption and pivot to privacy. <laughs> they don't know what you told your doctor. They don't know what you told your psychiatrist. They don't know what you told your, the suicide hotline, but they know that that whole picture just happened, and that is Facebook's pivot to privacy, which is front page news. Can I very yeah, efficiently yeah. speak up for yeah. Facebook? I've never done this in my entire career. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll start by saying I'm skeptical they're going to get to the full, fully realized vision because of what all the pundits are saying. This is kind of incompatible with the business model, right? Although Washcon has a way, it's not. But I will say that privacy is multifarious and there's lots of ways of talking about it. There are some downstream benefits to privacy if they could achieve the full vision, especially of what Zuckerberg said in March, less so what they said at F8, right? Because part of the premise here is Facebook will become less public by default. We'll have fewer moments where it's you talking to 4,000 of your friends and more moments where you're encouraged to hole away in a small group and share intimacy and share confidentiality and I still believe there's an age-old debate in legal uh, scholarship about content versus non-content um, and whether or not privacy law ought to treat those two differently. And I've always come down on the side of saying, yes, both. They're both really sensitive and important. But I still do think content is pretty precious uh, and, and has the capability to cause you great harm. So if Facebook really is blinding itself to all of your content. I think that's not a zero you know, victory for privacy. I think that might be a net improvement. I, mean, I don't know if they're a, ever going to get there. From a money perspective, like from the ad market right. perspective, that has zero But I'm, I'm less concerned with that. I'm more yeah. concerned with what are the harms that are going to befall people from their use of their service, right? So, and to me, I think there's a story to tell where Facebook becomes net-net a little bit more privacy protective so, with this uh, new model. Two, two things. One, um, with one exception that I flagged uh, in 2014 that generated a bunch of lawsuits, this is uh, the clicking on the hyperlink? Or? This is on the monitoring private chats. Yeah, yeah. So if, uh, they, they were monitoring when, when if, if yeah. I messaged to Paul and I said, I love United Airlines, United would get a like count uh, based on that communication. Uh, outside of that, they were not, my understanding is they're not monitoring private chats for the purpose of ad serving. Sure. Um, two, uh, to kind of Dina's point, the metadata about me interacting with United Airlines in my example tells you that I like air travel. And so if another airline wants to advertise to someone that's interested in air travel, right, right um, that metadata is still available. Um, so it still provides like a, a decent uh, ability to profile. The thing that I think is most telling about this conversation, and I want to go back to um, Paul's example of the Wiretap Act. So, um, and I've used this, you know, I use this in my testimony, I've talked about this a number of times. How many are familiar, how many have you heard about, have, have seen news stories or podcasts about Facebook monitoring your uh, private communications. When you say something, you know, the microphone is on and suddenly you get an advertisement for something you just said. How many have heard that anecdote? It's floated around. 
kind of for the last three or four years, I think, um, I have, for a number of folks, tested that um, pretty intensively, including like decrypting pin keys and figuring out how to kind of create a methodology for monitoring that, um, you know, kind of not tied back to me. Um, and I have not found evidence of that happening, of the fact that I literally instrumented a phone that any time the microphone, uh, the operating system would tell me any time the microphone was ever touched by the, by the software, any software. So I've done some tests to do that, and you can't never be sure. But what I think that tells you is that um, to the degree that people believe that the insights available from kind of this, this metadata, their browsing activity, their, act, their activity on the platform, seems like insights that could only be ma made available from monitoring a private conversation, right, maybe that thing should be protected like the Wiretap Act, right? So like you don't need to monitor people's conversations to, to make those insights. They seem so in intimate, so intuitive, so, so, uh, so compelling that people only believe it could be those insights were available through the monitoring of the microphone. I think maybe we should consider uh, protecting that, 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 uh, that uh, Thanks, Matt, and we, we have 15 minutes left, so let me open it to the audience. Matt, we'll start with you. So thank you, and this was an amazing panel. Um, I'm incredibly impressed with all of, all of your work. Uh, so I have a question for you. Next week, the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chairman Lindsey Graham is gonna be holding a hearing on concentration in ad tech. And I know there's been this discussion at the Federal Trade Commission about using their, uh, their authority to collect information about this ecosystem to try to do a study um, of advertising, online advertising, or various other tech markets. And um, the FTC actually has the authority to get the data that you're looking for. And, um, and then congressional committees can also get the data uh, if they really want it. So, my question is, and I, and I guess this is more for Alessandro, but feel free to chime in otherwise. What should they ask for specifically? What the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, House Antitrust Subcommittee, the Federal Trade Commission? Uh, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I was not aware, uh, I had heard about a meeting, but I was not aware that it would cover specifically this angle and the, 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 the potential ability to um, uh, compel disclosure of this information. So um, my answer would be a little bit more general than I would love and probably you expect. Uh, I would love to continue the discussion offline. And the general discussion is the following, that um, the general answer is the following. I was mentioning earlier, I believe, that there is this paradox of the transparency and that economy being so opaque. Uh, Dina was also pointing out uh, scenarios where businesses, small businesses, are not sophisticated enough to know whether the ads they are paying for are actually being shown to bots or not, right? So we generally need much more, much more transparency, not on consumer data, but on what happens once the consumer data enters this uh, large black box. So in practical terms, in specific terms, I'm afraid that I'm not answering directly your question, but in general terms, I believe that if we really believe that the world should be more transparent, we should start from the data industry and provide information about uh, what are the flows of information and what are the flows of money. Uh, we have the technology nowadays to do it, meaning that you can imagine, and as a reviewer for several privacy conference on the technical side, on the computer science angle, there are, there are so many protocols that have explained how to attach metadata to personal information so that you can follow, you can get into real attribution. You can really follow the life cycle of information through all these different databases. So it's not a technological problem. We have the technology for that. It's a economic incentives and compelled disclosure problem. Sorry for, it was a little a general answer. But. And, uh, and real quick, one of the fascinating things about this space. So folks know this idea of like, there's trackers online tracking you everywhere, you know, for advertising. Um, what's fascinating is those numbers have grown, the number of trackers kind of that you encounter on a website. And part of it is for behavioral advertising, sure. A lot of it is that nobody in this industry trusts the other person, hmm. right? So if I want to place an ad, I also want to place my verification service and my ad fraud service. 
right? So everyone in the chain pulls in double verify or they provi pr pr provide another analytic service or a conversion tracking service to figure out attribution and conversions. And so everyone is measuring everyone else. As a result, consumers' data is going to like hundreds of places, but no one trusts one another uh, uh, in this ecosystem and is constantly trying to figure out, is it a real, bo you know, is it a real bot, is it not? Um, last week, I think Facebook announced something like 580 million accounts were shut down in the first quarter of 2018, right, as a result of, uh, of you know, of fake, fake accounts, right? There's, like, all the advertisers that pay to advertise to those fake users, right? Like, it's not clear, you know, how many of those, uh, how many ads were shown to those users, whether those active users, but all those advertisers want to know whether those ads were seen or not, or, 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 or and whatnot. So it's kind of a fascinating industry. This side. Um, hi. So first, yeah, I agree with that the panel is on fire. Um, I just had a quick question, basically about so that four percent number is fascinating, and and you do point out uh, at the fact that there are you know countervailing issues. You know what what are the costs in privacy? But we could even look at direct economic costs to publishers. Right, the traditional publishing model is that you build up an audience, you control that audience because they come to you, and you sell to advertisers against that audience. But now, when there are third parties involved, especially in the bidding system, where there are hundreds of, if not thousands of third parties seeing that data, even if they don't get the ad, they see the bid, right? And therefore, they can track that audience. Those people all have the publisher's audience. They have a copy of it, which they can target elsewhere. That means the, the publisher is no longer monetizing that audience in full, they no longer have control over their own audience. Um, that's probably worth more than 4%. And I was wondering if you, if you had been thinking of ways of measuring the impact of basically audience theft by Google, Facebook, and a whole host of third parties, um, you know, in a context in which local news is dying and it's all that. That's a very interesting angle. It adds one more one more wrinkle. We have not tackled that yet, so uh, I apologize again. The answer will be a little brief, but it's something else that goes into the list of studies we want to run. We, we have one study now about, uh, well, a couple of studies about the impact GDPR had on publishers. Um, but this particular angle was novel, and I would be interested in studying the two. Good, thank you. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And there's, there's two versions of that, right? There's ability to know when the audience, the individual that's targeted on the high, kind of the high content site, like the New York Times, is targeted on the lower CPM site. So like, you know, Paul's blog, no offense. Hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's the other version, which is what, ver what number of the audience target that identified on the New York Times is then targeted by the platform's own service, like on Facebook or on Google, right? So there's two versions of that. Um, so on the mechanisms of market power and remedies, the German uh, Competition Authority earlier this year found that Facebook had been uh, uh, exploitatively gathering data, just as you described, by aggregating across Instagram and uh, its own site, but also the sites uh, that are visited by people across the web, and that this was done without adequate consent, and they imposed what they called uh, an internal divestiture. Um, so it I don't know if you call it a behavioral or a structural remedy, it's one dressed up as the other. Um, I'm interested in uh, putting aside, the, you know, we don't have that way of approaching antitrust law here, putting aside the question of what is a competition authority doing enforcing data protection law when the data protection authorities are not doing it. Right. I'm very interested in your views on the efficacy of this as a remedy, uh, a much lighter kind of uh, political cost to impose uh, in preventing the aggregation of that data. What does that do to Facebook's business model? Does it uh, weaken its incentive to, to, to hold these three uh, together? What does it do for competition? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I think that this is the most effective remedy, right? So if you look at the market's history and you understand that when Facebook faced competition, I mean, it's, it's gathering, it's, it's unifying data not only from Instagram and WhatsApp, but also literally from over 8 million other properties, right? So if you look at the market's history and you understand that this, this looks like a monopoly rent, right? So for 10 years, the market competition did not let Facebook get away with this behavior. So it's a, it's a terribly effective remedy 
to either automatically opt users out of that horizontal framework, right? And it simultaneously, you know, fixes part of the problem for publishers as to why their inventory is getting depreciated from a pricing perspective. And, you know, we can angle in from, you know, econ theory and say, okay, well, if users are not being watched, output is probably going to increase, right? Um, I, think it's, I think it's terribly effective. But I, the, worry, I worry about enforcement, though, right? That's going to be very hard to police, uh, especially when you think about the complexity of data in a kind of modern company like that, right? So, and I think you made this point in your paper. I don't think so. They just have to, like, remove the, the, the user stable ID, like, from Yeah, this. but they're spread throughout, like, how many different tables and how many different, you know, cloud centers. But they centers. did this for, like, we have four plus, years Plus, plus, as you say history. in your paper, they're also going to derive a lot of the value in the models they build. And then they'll say, that's all we're going to do. We're going to do that first step. We're going to build the model. We'll never touch that data again. But the, the but data, the data the lives data, within the model. As but you, the data has, yeah. so data in advertising markets has like a shelf six life. month shelf life. Yeah. Right. Literally six yeah. months shelf life and it's done. Yeah. So yeah. they have to continuously know, you know, did, are you in the automotive market I'm not saying today? it's impossible. I'm just saying it raises, yeah. like splitting the company in two and watching what happens at the interface. Not that I advocate for that. I actually think that's not the right remedy. But the for problem privacy, with that but, is if you split. But the that's a lot. That's a lot easier to observe. You made the enforcement. Uh, but you don't better. fix any of the problems. I, right? I, so I just said that. I said that's not yeah. the remedy I want. Except enforcement is easier. Right? Can, can I make a yeah. plug? So the California law has a bunch of provisions, right? So there's a, the right to know, right to delete, right from some a data security with a private right of action. The key operating piece of the, the California law is the right to say no to the sale of your data, and what that essentially says is that you can tell a company, a first party, a publisher that you're interacting with, that they can use the data on a first party basis for advertising, for contextual advertising, as in Alessandro's paper, but it restricts the ability for the, the first party to share data with a third party, to for, say, for Google or Facebook. The right? first party is like New York Times, New York third, Times party third party is, is Facebook. Facebook or Google. Right? And what's interesting is that it even has a provision to say that the, the New York Times doesn't need to set, a, set itself up as a publisher, or as a, uh, sorry, as an advertiser. You can rely on Google as an advertiser as long as they operate as a service provider. So Google would essentially shift from a third party cross-site tracking service to essentially Amazon Web Services, where they would silo the, your, your data only for the New York Times, and that data is not intermixed with data from the Washington Post, nor is it intermixed with data from uh, Google.com itself. Right? And that's kind of the, f the framework of the law and that the way it's structured. Um, and I think you know, the AG will enforce that. So to the degree that you're concerned about enforcement, that's the, you know, kind of that's the, the hook of the law. Um, and from a competition standpoint, one last piece is unlike GDPR, the, the opt-out provision exists in the browser. So you can essentially, um, uh, so you can, once a consumer opts out, it will opt out uniformly across all publishers or all sites. Doug. So I, this question, I think, is for Dana in the first instance. Um, let's grant that, that Facebook and Google have monopoly power or a lot of market power, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, imagine that they have two ways of uh, taking advantage of this, of this power. One is by charging uh, the, the monopoly dollar price. And the other is by engaging in a barter transaction in whole or in part in which they get information from advertisers or from users. Leave aside the possibility that price discrimination is easier in barter. That's a technical complication. Just leave that aside. One would think that if they choose barter, rather than exercising their power for cash, it's because the value to them of the information is greater than the cost to the user of giving it up. And if that's true, that that would be a wealth enhancing and efficient transaction compared to the alternative of being an ordinary monopoly charging monopoly prices. I suspect you don't agree with that, and my question is, why is barter, in this, uh, given those assumptions, worse than simply exercising the market power by charging a cash price? Well, I, I, sorry, Doug, can you, can you repeat the question? What do you, yeah, I'm not following. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, I'll try <laughs> it again. I'll, I'll see if I can do it in different words now. Um, it, it would, it, if you imagine a normal monopoly charges a monopoly price, and we worry about that, but th that's uh -huh. a straightforward issue. Um, the focus in this panel, appropriately given the topic, has been on, on the implications of data, and you put it in terms of exercising market power, and, and I take it they do that because instead of asking for a cash price, uh, 
they're asking in whole or in part for a barter trade. They're saying pay us in information instead of cash. Right. I assume they're doing that because the value of the information is greater to them than the amount of cash they could get from the user, right. which probably means it's greater than what the user believes is the cost to it of giving up the data. And if, that, if all that's true, it looks like the barter is an efficient and welfare-enhancing transaction compared to letting the monopolist do the ordinary thing monopolists do, which is just charging a high cash price. I okay. suspect you don't agree with that, and my question is why not? Well, um, I'm, not sure if I'm, gonna an an I'm not sure if I'm answering that question, but first of all, we, we don't have any market mechanism that currently exists from a technological perspective that allows users to sell their data. So we just don't have that mechanism that exists. And I might analogize to, for example, um, competition in the television or the cable industry. Like, you know, the, the user's paying constant price, but competition is happening on the number of ad minutes that are served per hour, right? And so the, the extraction of monopoly power, even in that situation, is is putting more ad minutes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the lack of mechanism, but then you also just have like market history to measure like what was the barter for the first 10 years, you know, and you have all this empirical data of consumer preference and consumer resistance and the market mechanism working and restraining, you know, this type of exchange. And then the barter, you know, skyrockets to, you know, from we take your data based on what you use on Facebook to now we take your data based on what you use on 8 million, like, you know, so that's sort of the hockey stick and the barter equation as well. Just a, unfortunately, we are, oh, this is a quick question, or a quick comment, that this, this issue is going to come to light in light of the California law for one key provision. As I said, it allows consumers to opt out, request a publisher, for example, to not sell their data. But the decision was made not to deny a consumer service. So in that context, if you request a publisher not sell your data, the publisher can charge you to still use the good, except in the, in the law, it requires that the publisher charge you what the value it gets from the sale of your data and articulate that uh, to the AG. So the, the publisher will be required if it charges on consumer's data to articulate what that value of that data is, which will then have some insights in the marketplace in terms of uh, kind of what, the, what, what they get from the sale of data versus what they make uh, from the use of the data first party. Great. Thank you very much. We're out of time, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Thank you. We're back in the, on the sixth floor. Please head over there as soon as possible since we're running late and start eating because we are running late. <laughs>